Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everybody to the fifth meeting of the Education and Culture uh, Committee in 2015? Can I remind everybody, as usual, to switch off all electro electronic devices um, in case they interfere with the sound system? Uh, our first item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence on the charity test specified bodies and the protection of charities assets exemption Scotland amendment order 2015. Uh, can I welcome Fiona Hislop, Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Europe and External Affairs and her supporting officials from the Scottish Government. Good morning, morning. to all of you. Um, after we have taken evidence on the instrument item one, we will debate the motion in the name of the Cabinet Secretary item two. Officials are of course not permitted to contribute during that part uh, of the formal debate at item two. Uh, therefore, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make some opening remarks? Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Committee Members. I, I believe that uh, public bodies are responsible for looking after our treasured national cultural resources, such as Historic Environment Scotland, have charitable purposes at the heart of their existence. And there are many examples of public bodies with charitable status looking after the historic environment, including our CAMs in Scotland and the historic royal palaces in England. The Committee will recall we discussed the implications of charitable status for Historic Environment Scotland last year. We examined a wide range of issues in some depth, uh, focusing especially on the potential impacts for other charities in the sector, the risks of conflicts of interest. And we also discussed the potential financial benefits and other less tangible benefits of the special role that charities contribute to public life. In the end, it will be for the newly appointed Board of Historic Environment Scotland to assess the benefits of charitable status for this body at this time. However, before they can make a decision whether or not to apply for charitable status, ministers must amend two existing orders which would exempt Historic Environment Scotland from certain provisions of the Charities and Trustees Investment Act 2005. And the order under consideration today will make those amendments. First, Section 74 uh, of the 2005 Charities Act prevents bodies which are subject to ministerial direction from becoming charities. This means that generally public bodies can't be charities. However, the Act also includes powers to exempt uh, certain bodies from this provision, allowing them to become charities while being subject to ministerial direction. This reflects the specific nature of some public bodies whose activities clearly serve charitable purposes. The exemption is already in place for other national collections, uh, including ARCAMS. It is therefore logical to extend this approach to Historic Environment Scotland, which will hold a national collection relating to the historic environment. The draft order achieves this by adding Historic Environment Scotland to the Charity Test Specified Bodies Scotland Order 2006, which lists exempted bodies. Second, uh, Section 19 of the Charities Act protects the charitable assets of bodies when they cease to be charities. It requires them to continue to operate those assets in accordance with their charitable purposes and allows OSCAR to transfer such assets to another charity. Now, the Act includes powers to exempt specified bodies from these provisions, in this case ensuring that assets which were funded by the public purse remain under ministerial control in the event that a body were to lose or surrender charitable status. This exemption is already in place for other national collections and I'm proposing to extend this approach to Historic Environment Scotland. So, finally, this order delivers on the Government's commitment to treat HES as we treat our other national co uh, cultural collections and as we already treat our CAMs. I believe this approach has the support of all key stakeholders and I would welcome this committee's support and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Do members have any questions they wish to raise? Uh, Liam. A question, possibly a comment, um, convening. We've had discussions with various um, uh, statutory instruments that have been brought before us about um, the detail uh, under the section on consultation. Now, I, I think the consultation here does um, uh, quite appropriately point to the discussion we had within the context of the, of the bill, and I think you've alluded to that again this yeah. morning, Cabinet Secretary. I think my concern stems from then the, the sections on impact assessment and financial effects which do rather kind of gloss over the, 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 the fact that there was quite a robust debate during the passage of the bill about the, the likely impacts, whether the quality's impact or, or probably more likely the, the uh, financial impact on uh, other bodies. I think the National Trust were, were um, particularly vocal in that regard. Now, the government's taken its view, Parliament um, also has kind of taken a view, but I think just for the, the purposes of transparency, that it would be helpful with the, with the policy note to maybe better reflect um, that, that discussion and, and, and the points that were being made on both sides of the argument. 
Um, there's quite a lot in there. I think the point, well, first of all, in the consultation, uh, I deliberately made sure the committee was aware during the passage of the bill um, the issues around the impact or not of having charitable status. We made it quite clear during the examination that the viability of the new historic environment in Scotland was not dependent on whether it had charitable status or not. Um, so there's quite a lot of, um, you know, I think, proactive provision from the government in terms of what the implications were in the consultation of the bill, which was only uh, last year, and that was a very full consultation. Similarly, as you, as you quite rightly reflect, there was quite a lot of discussion about the impact potentially on other other bodies. That was determined and that discussion was taken at the time that we were looking at the actual bill itself. And indeed, this committee made, made a number of comments during your stage one report, but also in the series of debates. I think if you could recall, the, the final issue um, which gave comfort to other organisations, including the National Trust for Scotland, was that HES would operate under the historic environment uh, strategy, which has brought everyone together. We've got a historic environment forum for the first time, bringing all the different agencies together. And the key issue, again, comes into the point that um, why, why it's important that we have this order is that the ministerial direction I may want to... Uh, to, to use in the future. Remember, reminding you, I've never used it before in seven years for all the bodies I've had, is if for some reason Historic Environment Scotland worked in, in counter to the interests of the wider historic environment, for example, mm. were somehow doing something that was detrimental to any other bodies. So the protection that charities have would be, and other bodies would have, is within the historic environment strategy to which they have to, historic environment Scotland have to uh, make sure that they're supporting and if there wasn't that would be an issue. That was an issue Mary Scanlon quite rightly um, tested during the provision of the bill. So actually we've had quite a lot of discussion already fairly recently by this committee um, on, on these areas and I, I think finally there is a lot in the question, I think it's a very important question, is well, what does it provide? Um, having charitable status would, for example, allow Historic Environment Scotland as a charity to help the whole sector grow the cake of what might be provided. The concerns people had is that limited resources, everybody competing, that's a, a detriment. Where the Historic Environment Forum and the discussions are that we've been having to date are taking us is actually we should expand what we're doing and try and grow the cake and the availability. Obviously, in terms of uh, Historic Environment Scotland, if it chose to, we're not saying it has to, it will be up to the body to decide it would have um, access to gift aid, uh, rates relief, etc. But also importantly, in working with other organisations, they might be able to, the, for example, um, approach the European Commission for funding in a way that government bodies can't. Um, they wouldn't be able to do that just now. But in doing so, the, the, the sensible way of doing that is to work with other bodies like the National mm -hmm. Trust, etc. So it's enabling. But at the end of the day, whether or not that the debate today is not whether or not it should become a charity that is a debate for the, the board to take and for them to decide and the debate to, today is if they so chose to become a charity um, is it sensible that they are treated the same as other collections that would one allow ministerial direction if there needs to be and i've gone through this i think a lot with the committee that is that would be a certainly last resort has never happened to date um, and i would be things should be resolved far in advance of that and secondly if for some reason it if it did decide to become a charity but at some point in the future um, either decided not to be or you know had charitable status taken away from it public money that's been invested in public assets would still come back to ministers and they would be in control of that instead of oscar so i've kind of i know that's a long mm -hmm. answer but there was a lot in that important question from you i, I mean I, I think that's a fair response and a fair sort of characterization of the debate we had about yeah, yeah. The, the, the case for and, and, uh, and potentially against um, the move to charitable status. And obviously it's for the board to make the decision to, to make that application. It's for Oscar to decide whether or not um, it, ultimately it's compliant. I think my concern is more that um, we are all familiar with that um, discussion because yeah. we were, we were okay. sort of protagonists in it. Um, but, but just looking at the policy note here, it, it, and particularly in relation to financial effects, it says the impact of charitable status was considered during the uh, business and regula regulatory impact assessment carried out for the 2014 Act, which found that there would be no financial impact. And, and I think that does rather gloss over what was a lively debate, albeit that ultimately came down on the, on, on the side of um, saying, well, that this, that, that this bill should proceed, it ultimately will be for the board, and there are reassurances that have been provided. But I think probably as a committee, 
we will want to return to this if, if in the event National Trust or others come back to us and say, you know what, in practice this isn't working as, 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 we, were, as we were assured. Well, I think that's in relation to the wider policy context. So the, the convener of the clerks can correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're presenting an order, when you're looking at the financial impact, the financial impact is on the order itself and on the, the public purse, as in you know, will it have an impact on the body considering in this case historic environment is gone, or will there be a financial impact on the government? What you're talking about is a financial impact on, on organisations that are not subject to the order that we're currently considering. Now, that's a bit of a, I suspect, a, a legal anorak answer. Is it correct, Camino? So, therefore, we've been quite precise in it, but I understand you, you, mm. what you're interested in is actually the wider policy mm. context in this, but maybe that's something the committee can um, discuss itself, is in looking at orders, should you be focusing just on the order in front of you, or to what extent do you want wider um, context? Now, in this case, because the wider context was fully debated and discussed and examined by, very thoroughly by this committee, and debated in the Chamber, and we responded to, that we assumed that that's a, kind of a, a reasonable position to take, but technically, um, you know, I, I think the, the point that there's no financial impact, it means there's no financial impact on the Scottish Government or on the new body, HES, to which this applies. I'm sorry, Kavir, I think I'm in your hands on this. No, no, that's, that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, just for, uh, to remind members, we did agree at the time that we would um, probably come back to the, the bill uh, or the Act to later this year and look at it again. So, we, you know, that, that's in the ready in the work programme for us later in the year. So, um, yeah. Chick Brodie. Good morning. Good morning. You said there's no financial impact, and yet earlier, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned that it may allow <coughs> a, the body HES to apply for European funding, etc. I mean, how, what is actually driving this change? Uh, well, the, one of the, well, if you go right back to the beginning, and I don't think the, the member was in the committee at the, at the time yeah. we took evidence um, on different bodies way, way back. Uh, one of the issues around HARCAMs, and I gave a commitment to the commissioners in HARCAM that we would protect um, the... Um, basically the kind of underlying tenets of what ARCAMS provided and that that would not be compromised. Now one of the issues there was particularly in relation to their education service. We were very keen that the, um, the, the, the element of their education service which was charitable would be able to be accommodated in the new body. So that was one of the areas. Also in relation to opportunity the, um, whether it's gift aid or rates relief, there was somewhere we reckon between 1.4 million and 2.1 million thereafter could be gained by having a charitable so status. So there is a financial impact? The, for the body so if it chooses to do so, right? If it chooses to do this order, it does not decide whether or not the um, body should become a charity. All it does is enable them, if they so chose, to become a charity, but to protect ministers that they would be allowed to have minister direction. So what you're examining today is not whether or not it should become a charity, but whether or not, if it decides itself to become a charity, um, that... Um, Ministers would have one still powers of direction, as we have under the other couple of its National Museum of Scotland, National Galleries, etc. And also, which I think would be in the interest of the public, that if at some point in the future they decide they, they either had charitable status taken away or they chose not to be, that the assets would not be determined by Oscar, but would be determined by ministers. So it's kind of similar to <clears throat> my answer to, to Liam, is that the, what we're addressing here is the order and what the order does in relation to the Charities Act. It's not a decision as to whether or not it should become a charitable status. That was thoroughly discussed by the previous um, you know, examination of the, of the bill itself. So again, comes back to the financial impact, is about the impact of the order itself, and the order itself is about powers of ministers, not actually about the powers of heads. Is this indeed any of the other governmental uh, charities? Uh, have they been contested by other members who are subscribed to Oscar, other charities, in terms of the protection of the assets uh, by the government? I think, um, it was two, I would correct me, 2005 is the act that we're debating. I remember taking part in that at the time. In fact, it was a strong view of Parliament that our national collections, and it was cross party, that our national collections um, should have uh, the powers um, to be charities, so it could be listed as charities under the act. But there was also recognition, the checks and balances, that they didn't want them to be completely exempt from ministerial direction. There may be some instances, probably corporate governance or that kind of area. And as I've said, you know, under you know, my um, term as a, a minister, for, and it's now coming on eight years, I have never used a you know, power of ministerial direction on a body. But it's, a, it's like a safety net. If, if it, if it uh, needs, but, needs... But that really was my question. My question, I understand that, and, and 
and, and subscribe to it somewhat. My question is, can it be contested by other non-governmental charities in terms of how they wish to protect their assets? Well, you, you might want to explain what do you mean. Why would somebody want to, like another body? This is, the relationship is with, between us and the, and, the, and the national collections. It's not with other charitable bodies. Why would any other charitable bodies? Um, I don't understand the, the premise of your, your question as to why you think another external body would challenge whether or not there was ministerial direction or whether. No, I'm saying we've been specific that, that there's one rule for government in, in, in the charitable status. And, and I understand why we want yeah. to protect these assets. Uh, and, and another rule for other charities who, who may have a, or may wish to have an asset distribution uh, model or activity. Well, f take for example, I think the National Trust would not take kindly to this committee or this parliament or this government saying to them that if at some time they wanted to change their charitable status, that the state would take control of all, all their assets. I think that's what you're implying, and that they would. They, are you suggesting they might want to have the same treatment? As no, I'm, I'm talking about other charities versus the government in terms of the rules, specifically applicable to uh, to the government in terms of control of the assets. I mean, I, I, I take your point in terms of the assets, but. As I understand it, I, I may be wrong, that should charitable status be uh, removed, then the assets are the government's anyway. I'm just saying, what is the comparison between non-governmental bodies and governmental bodies in terms of... Do you want to try and answer that one? Uh, if, if I might uh, try to assist, with a charity, if a charity ceases to be a charity, the normal rule uh, for all charities is that Oscar, the charity's regulator, uh, will uh, ensure that the assets of that charity are disposed of to another body which can continue to use those assets for the charitable purposes for which they were originally being used. Those assets for a charity which hasn't received substantial government funding as, as a core of its being uh, would have been accumulated basically by contributions from members, money the charity earned and so on. So they belong to that charity. So somebody has to act as a, a go-between to get those onto a new charity to carry on being charitable. In the case of the assets of the national collections and quite a number of other uh, public bodies, the government has been the main contributor to the okay. accumulation and care Sorry. of those assets. So the government is saying we've spent public money uh, on this body to help it to accumulate, to develop these assets for the charitable purposes it serves. We're taking it as a responsibility of the government to ensure that they are passed on to another body. Now, in an extreme case, that might mean the government has to create another body to take on that role. That's not something which Oscar could do. So it's a means of ensuring the government takes its responsibilities for bodies which it has been supporting, has been funding, and ensures that those responsibilities are carried forward. So this is, it is a special arrangement for government bodies, but it's a special arrangement for government bodies because they contain money which has been given to those bodies over many years by the government to accumulate the assets which are supporting the charitable purpose. So that's what Convener has said in terms of my previous answers. It's in relation to the public money aspect that had been invested over many years, which is of interest. And I think, again, this committee, the Parliament, and the government and the public, the, the public in Scotland would have real concerns. You know, after many generations of investment in national collections, were they then to be distributed to other bodies other than government to decide what to do with? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mary Scanlon has a question, I believe. Thank you. Really, just as seeking clarity, I was on the committee that, uh, of this Parliament convener that set up Oscar uh, in 2005, and I think I'm right yeah. in saying that the National Museums and others, they were already charities, whereas uh, should HES go forward, they would be facing a fairly yeah. robust test, as we would all expect, uh, by Oscar, and this uh, instrument today obviously opens a door for them. So it's just two points, and uh, they're not exactly new but I do remember how important the independence test of the charity was in uh, achieving its own outcomes in accordance with its own principles and I'm just uh, uh, I would just like some clarity yeah. from the Cabinet Secretary as to how does the independence of a charity sit alongside ministerial direction, mm. and I hear everything you've said today, um, that you haven't used the powers yeah. in eight years. Um, but secondly, and we did receive quite a bit of evidence uh, about this convener, and that was from other charities saying... Well, the government allocates money, the government disburses huge amounts of money. Will they automatically choose those over which they have ministerial direction, irrespective of how important uh, 
that collection is to mm -hmm. the country and I can't remember exactly who it was that sent in the evidence, but there were some genuine concerns. So it's just a bit of clarity around yeah. those two issues. Okay. Um, an important point for not just TES but also the other collections is that government does not interfere in the curatorial decision making as to what they do with the collections. Um, and indeed, the scrutiny by this committee on the National Libraries Bill in particular made quite clear um, their views on that. And indeed, in terms of that legislation and indeed in the legislation that governs Historic Environment Scotland, we made it absolutely clear that there would not be curatorial... That was in the debate we had at, at stage one, as Mary Scallon rightly remembers, that would not have curatorial direction. Remember, it will be up to HES to decide whether it wants to apply to be a charity. And then secondly, it will actually be up to Oscar to determine whether it passes that independence test that she quite rightly identifies. And if you can, re can recall, during the passage of the bill, Oscar um, made a statement to the committee and, uh, or, or, and to ourselves. And uh, I quote from Oscar, it says, has had, uh, Oscar has had sight of the functions of Historic Environment Scotland in Section 2 of the Bill, that was the HES Bill, and our view is that, in principle, these can be clearly linked to one or more of the charitable purposes set out in the 2005 Act. So Mary Scanlon is quite right that the final decision will be with Oscar. It will be in relation to the independence that they see, um, but we've certainly drafted the Bill um, in accordance that should HES decide to become a charity, we think that the independence that's set out in those provisions should enable it to become a charity if Oscar agrees that they should be. And my second part about the concerns from uh, other uh, organisations yeah. to say that given that yeah. the government has control over so much yeah. funding, will, you know, will, will uh, HES be given preferential treatment uh, irrespective of how important buildings or collections yeah. are to the nation? Uh, well, one of the things that we made quite clear is that HES would not provide grants to itself. The, the grants, and I've managed to protect grants so far, which has been really kind of a, a challenge in the financial circumstances. And I think that was one of the assurances they wanted, was that it wouldn't suddenly be able to just decide it has a fund, public funding and it will just give grants to its own works. Obviously, it would need to have provision for its ongoing care, maintenance and development, but um, that's an important part of um, the, the kind of separation of interests. And also, the historic environment strategy is... One of the purposes is to make, enable collectively um, all the different bodies to try and sort of share what the priorities are. You know, is it, um, is it the buildings of castles? Is it the streetscapes of our conservation areas? To try and actually work collectively to make the most of what we have in challenging times. So actually, the historic environment strategy, the form that I put together, will help actually collectively Scotland decide what the priorities are, as opposed to one sole body saying they will determine everything that will happen in that area. Sorry, it was really more about the government, you know, having ministerial direction and Over. also having the ability to uh, disburse funds. Um, there may be preferential treatment. It, it's, it was just for clarity. I haven't got an issue with it, but I do think it's worth raising because yeah. it was a concern during evidence. Well, I think, I th I think, I think as a government minister, the more, I can, more resources I can allocate with the, the committee's support to Historic Environment Scotland, the better for everybody, because not only would HES get the benefit of that, but other bodies as well would. So that's the route for disbursement. And if you separate that they won't be able to give grants to themselves, that actually gives the protection that a lot of the... That's, that was the point that actually a lot of organisations came to us about and were satisfied with our, our response on that. OK, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to move now on to item two, which is the formal debate on the instrument. Uh, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and move the motion? Um, can we, I'd just like to uh, just move that the uh, Education and Culture Committee recommends that the charity test specified bodies <coughs> and the protection of charities assets exemption Scotland Amendment Order 2015 be approved. Uh, thank you very much. Do members uh, wish to make a contribution? No. Co I presume you don't want to make any other further comment after that? No, no? I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> Okay, can I put the question to the committee that motion S4M 12362 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? We're agreed. Thank you much. I suspend the meeting and will allow the witnesses to change over. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary.
Now, our next item is to take evidence on the implications for schools, teachers and pupils of the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce. The Commission's final report, often referred to, of course, as the Wood Report, after its author, was published last June, and the Scottish Government then published an implementation plan last December. Um, today's discussion is part of our ongoing work on educational attainment. And can I begin by welcoming to the committee James Bream from Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce, uh, Terry Lanigan, representing the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, Professor Alan Galloran from Queen Margaret University, Kevin Loudon from the Robert Owen Centre for Educational Change, and of course, Mary Harrington, representing Colleges Scotland. Um, we've obviously got a large panel uh, this morning, so obviously I would be appreciative if members could keep their questions succinct and of course the answers likewise. Um, and we'll get through uh, as much as we can this morning. Um, given we've got such a large panel, I'm going to go straight to questions um, and I'm going to start with Mark Griffin. Thanks, Kevina. Just to start on a, a more broader basis before we get into the, the work of the, the Commission and the Government's implementation plan, if I can just ask a couple of questions about um, the attainment gap more broadly. And just to ask um, all five of the witnesses to see whether they think there is a, a common understanding or um, if they believe there is a particular... What springs to mind to them if you, if you say um, closing the attainment gap? What does closing the attainment gap mean to you? Chair, um, to me, the, uh, closing the attainment gap means raising attainment for all young people in Scotland, but raising the attainment from those from the more disadvantaged backgrounds uh, more quickly uh, and to a greater extent, so that where you're born in Scotland becomes significantly less important to your life chances going forward. And I would say that in some of the statistical evidence that there is here, there is evidence of limited progress in, with regard to that. We can see that across uh, all SIMD deciles that attainment is rising, uh, and it is rising marginally more quickly for those from the most deprived deciles. I think that there is a long way to go, but I believe it's a, an agenda that uh, my colleagues and I, and indeed schools across the country, take very seriously indeed. And I also believe that the Wood uh, Commission, the, the developing the young workforce work, uh, can be, has the potential to be a powerful tool uh, in moving this agenda forward. Anybody else want to contribute? If I may, I'll just I agree with that statement, but I think the research also shows that there are pockets of a more extreme deprivation where the attainment gap faces particular challenges. Uh, but even there, I think there are uh, examples of innovation, particularly recently in some educational programmes where schools, local authorities and government, such as the, the School Improvement Partnership Programme, are addressing this issue. And I think it's very interesting to try and tease out what we mean by attainment and say that includes formal qualifications, but also broader achievement. And I think we need to to look carefully at that. Alan. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Sure. Um, I, I, I would agree with what my two colleagues have, have, have said, um, but I think, I think a lot of effort has gone into, particularly in the higher education sector, into widening participation. Uh, I think there's a lot of very good work has been done. I think it's, it's slowly making a difference, but I think in some ways we have to push that work back, and we have to push it back. A lot of it's been focused on 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds, uh, I think we really do need to start doing work, more work in primary schools. I think it's at that age where you're actually starting to set what people think about education, how they approach learning, the culture of learning. So I really do think that uh, examples I'm sure we'll come on to, like the Children's University, are very important in terms of uh, shifting the way that uh, very young people see learning uh, and, and trying to adopt a, a partnership approach. Um, I'm sure we'll come on to discuss some of the nitty-gritty of that. Uh, Mary? Um, good, mo good morning, um, committee. I equally I agree with my colleagues. However, for me, it's, um, it's not just about raising attainment. It's about making attainment more meaningful. Um, the, the Developing Scotland's Young Workforce is quite clearly 
aimed at the 50% or more of our young people who do not go to university. And it's about addressing the qualifications and pathways that those young people currently are studying with a view to improving them quite radically in terms of going forward. So for me, it's not just about raising attainment, it's about meaningful attainment. I would, uh, I, would, I would add to that from an employer's point of view, I think ultimately, why are we trying to attain qualifications? Um, it's to, to ensure people are ready for work, to ensure they can demonstrate that they're ready for work and provide, a, I suppose, a meaningful contribution pretty early on. Um, for me, there's uh, the low, low end of the attainment scale. Um, we certainly need to um, focus on that, but I don't think we should necessarily forget that actually there's, there's room for improvement at the top end as well, and, and we need to, to make sure that attainment's maximised across the whole spectrum. I think at the lower end, one observation I do have is that we need to address, I suppose, what we call a quality of access, as, as some families are well-networked and parents are well-networked, um, their, their children benefit from that in things like work placements. Um, others don't have that opportunity. And so I think as employers, we can actually do a lot to, um, to manufacture solutions to improve that situation. Okay, thank you. Mark? Yep. I mean, some of your answers lead me on to my next question. And we've had evidence, um, written evidence, um, suggesting um, that measures of attainment should be changed and that more credit should be given um, to those vocational qualifications. Um, would you support changes to uh, the, the measurement of attainment so that um, there's more credence given to those um, other vocational areas and do you think that would be a step towards closing the, the attainment gap? Mary. I think that's obviously a, a valid point and it's a concern that has been raised. Um, I think it's important to recognise that different qualifications are about measuring different things. Um, and just now we've got quite a, a narrow focus in terms of attainment and achievement measured by exams. Uh, vocational qualifications are more commonly measured by competence. Uh, and I think it's important that credit is given to that competence, um, but we don't make it about measuring the same, the same thing. They're not the same. Um, but it's about upping, I think, the value and credit that we give to assessing the, the competence of, of young people. Um, because I think that's where you can look at volume and breadth and depth of study, which is every bit as valid as your ability to pass an external exam. I, I think we just have to be a little bit careful about separating out vocational and academic. It makes me rather nervous. And I wouldn't want us to create or to look at creating two-tier systems where some people are just going for vocational. I think it's very important that we look at, in any kind of education, both of those, that we're looking to develop in young people skills that are important for vocational out outputs, but also there are some academic and there's some theoretical and conceptual stuff. I think we can do both. I think there should be a blend. I don't think it's an either-or. Sorry, Ted. I would absolutely agree with the, that last contribution. Um, a, a number of the submissions make the point that what we require here is a cultural change in Scottish society. Mm -hmm. And it's about the perception of the importance of vocational education or um, employment education, or call it what you will. Because I believe that, uh, that vocational education is a, as important to academic young people as it is to others. I mean, the, I think it is a false dichotomy when you talk about vocational as opposed to academic. If you think about it, the most high tariff courses in uh, Scottish universities, medicine, dentistry, veterinary medicine, are the most vocational qualifications that you can get. So, you know, the, the, the skills that are developed through um, work-based learning are as important to everyone in society. And I think that one of the challenges is about uh, persuading Scottish society, and particularly parents, not exclusively parents, but particularly parents, to recognise the value 
of different routes to, to lifetime achievement. And a, a modern apprenticeship, for instance, can be just as valuable to a youngster and can lead to a uh, degree level qualification while that young, young person is, is earning a wage uh, just as much as going straight to university, which there has been a sort of mantra about getting the maximum number into university. And for some of our young people, and we know this from the dropout rates at the end of first year, uh, that is not the most appropriate route. I'm, uh, I suppose, less concerned in some ways about measures about attainment when we look at what employers actually tell us, um, that 60 per cent, roughly, um, of employers will say that the main uh, indicator to whether a, a young person is going to be successful in a job is whether they've got relevant work experience, and yet 80 per cent tell us that um, most of the lack of work readiness is because of a lack of work experience. So when we start to speak about attainment and start to look at things like vocational activity and, and how people learn, um, the two of them go hand in hand. So I think if you can get that whole work experience thing right, um, the way we look at education in terms of uh, its interaction with employers, the, the cultural change needs to move through to an actual behavioural change. So work becomes very much ingrained in it and, and you know, I think we're of the view that the, the old fashioned way as I, as I had it of uh, one week work experience does the job, you know, it sim simply doesn't and I think you know, moving, moving that forward be, would be a huge thing for employers and young people. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mark, check. Yeah, good morning. Just if I may, just on, the, on this, you know, this vocational versus academic qualification, we all agree, I think, that there has to be a greater balance, but there's not. We haven't overcome the cultural challenge. I mean, how do we change the culture in terms of education, 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 university, 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 against an alignment of vocational qualifications uh, with, let's say, the government's economic strategy in the sectors it wants to play in? Because we can all talk about in, in whatever bubble we're in, but what we're not doing is, is change. I don't think, and I was at college yesterday, changing the impression that uh, people must go to, you know, still university is still the most important uh, feature of coming out of, uh, am I wrong, or? Uh, Terry. Uh, I, uh, I think it's a, it's a very important question, and I, I believe that we change it in two ways. We change it by the way that everyone and that includes political leaders, uh, the way that everyone talks about this agenda. Okay. Um, I think that the message that goes out there is extremely important, that we uh, do not artificially separate vocational and academic education, that we talk about it in a far more join, joined up way, and that we, that we talk about it as a, a, a universal right to high quality vocational education for, uh, for young people. The second way, however, that, that, uh, that we, we begin to change perceptions is by, uh, is by results and by illustrating to parents the different routes that are possible. So that, for instance, if I use a local example, um, there has perhaps in the past been a perception by uh, parents that uh, college is a less attractive option than university. Um, less academic option than university. We've now got a partnership with West College Scotland where a group of youngsters from one of our secondary schools, and it's going to be rolled up to, out to the rest next year, are doing an HNC in engineering uh, part-time at college this year and the rest of their subjects in school. And what that is showing parents, and parents have fully bought into mm -hmm. it, is that this is a, a, a role for the college sector which is as appropriate. Now, some of the youngsters that are doing this intend to go on to modern apprenticeships Others intend to go on to do uh, engineering at universities. And so what the, the parents are seeing there in that small example is the fact that the, the, a college education can be as valuable both in vocational and in academic terms to a range of youngsters of different abilities. So I, I think it's about illustrating the, the power of uh, different routes uh, to achievement. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the nature of modern apprenticeships at the moment. We need to get the message out there about how that can unlock a youngster's potential in a different way from the straight university route. Mary. Um, I, I think in addition to, to that, the, mm. the key difference 
I think, in terms of this particular step change, and it is a step change in our education system, is that at least half of the recommendations um, that come out of the Education Working for All were in relation to employers. Mm -hmm. And I think this um, particular change has got, already got significant buy-in from our employers across Scotland. There's um, two regional investing groups uh, already established. They were looked at right across Scotland. It's actually got quite a momentum already in terms of employer support, and I think that's what, in terms of working with partnership with the schools, with the colleges, in fact, it's a significant buy-in from employers that I think has got the potential to really drive forward this change in our, in our system. Okay, uh, uh, Kevin and then Alan. I would agree with the comments there. I think what historically parents' views on you know, the value and the esteem of vocational education have been important, but also uh, the, the attitudes of school staff and school leaders and the pressure they feel under to move towards academic outcomes. And, and, and I think you know, there's always been pressure to, for schools to perform in there, even though the political message may have shifted towards you know, a more, the message we've heard around the table. And I think the culture the, more broadly is changing, but there are still mixed messages, and yep. I think schools still feel yep. under pressure. Okay. Alan? Uh, Chick, I think it's a cracking question as to how you change that perception of, of, of different destinations for young people. So, you know, following up on what Terry said, when I think about our hospitality tourism academy and trying to get young people and their parents to recognise that working in hospitality and tourism is not just being a chef or it's not just being a waiter, yeah. that there's a whole range of career opportunities and that the average age of a general manager in that industry is... 35 um, and, and you look at what people are earning and you look at what opportunities there are in that kind of industry but many parents will look at hospitality and tourism and think you know you've mentioned medicine or you mentioned law so it is about changing that perception within the country as to um, uh, the value of, of different destinations it's, it's a challenge but I think there's a lot of good work going on okay thank you Okay. Uh, do you want me to... Other supplementaries? No, no, we'll come back okay. to you with yeah. that stuff. Uh, Liam. It's slightly been covered. I was very interested by what all of you just said in response to, to, to Chick's questions. And, and I mean, Terry, if I could offer an example. I uh, met very recently with um, a young apprentice taken on um, at St Magnus Cathedral in, in, in my constituency um, uh, to undertake a, a stonemasonry apprenticeship. Uh, a young girl by the name of Sophie Turner, who I think has become a bit of a poster child uh, for the Young Apprenticeship Scheme. Now, she'd been down the route um, of uh, a university education at Napier. I think photography was the, was the degree, but uh, an illustration of something that, yes, she was interested in, um, but the, 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 the kind of peer pressure within the school environment had meant that there really was never any discussion of, of a young apprenticeship. Um, and for as long as I suppose this debate is seen to be about how we raise attainment from those from non-traditional or poorer backgrounds, actually the, the political imperative, the, the drivers in the system will always be a bit muted. Actually what we need to see is, is more of those who are being channeled down the university route um, for, for laudable reasons, but, but uh, probably against their, their, their interests in terms of the, their longer term uh, attainment then this is, this is always going to be um, a, a, an impossible nut to crack. So actually it's as much about the attainment for those who are attaining quite well at the moment, but perhaps being put down um, pathways that are, are less well suited to their, um, to their actual uh, aspirations and, and, and their skill set. Would that be a, 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 fair, a fair comment to make? I, th I think that's a yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Alan. Yes, but if, if, if you look at, so for example, our, our academies programme, and the academies programme is now being picked up by other local authorities apart from the four local authorities that, that, that we work with, the, the, <clears throat> there are jumping off and jump, there are a whole lot of exit points. So it's not just about getting people into university. It is about demonstrating the benefit of college education, or it is about demonstrating the need to develop the, um, the relevant skills so you can move into work. And although we've only been operating the academies for, for two years, the, um, uh, the, the indicators are that some people leave and they go into work. 
but what we're hoping is that they go into work with a better idea as to what that work is with better attitudes, better mm. understanding and, and a better link with employers so that they're successful in that work and the same with the people who go to college and go to university. But, but back to your earlier point about needing to push this further back so it's not just a discussion at age 15, 16, 17. Yeah. I mean, clearly there, are, there is a cohort who are identified probably before they leave primary school as being of university material and there's never a discussion with them about whether they go to, 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 to college in, in terms of delivering that higher education, receiving that higher education, far less a discussion around modern apprenticeships. And that until what you've got is a better balance um, in, in terms of the, the demographic at, at, at college as, as compared to, to university, that kind of parity of esteem um, or, or that division between them is always going to um, be, be, be more marked, is it not? Uh, Kevin, yeah. if I could just add, I think it's very interesting. I think both the reports touch on this, but going back early into the education system, where I think young people, as we find ourselves as adults, will change their ideas about where they want to go, their skills develop, their, uh, their orientation. So that trajectory, and I think it's a, it's, it's a careful balance about providing sufficient information to allow informed choice and allowing those various pathways and to make sure we don't sort of channel people and say, you know, at, at primary school, your university material, and on you go, so much can happen over there. But I think the education system itself has to be nuanced enough uh, to provide opportunities and partnership working with the right guidance, the right organisations. And something uh, Alan was saying there about systems that articulate, so FE articulate, so EHE and so on. So if people do change the trajectory and want to change, then the system itself will allow that as their skills develop. Mm. So it's that building in flexibility. Okay, uh, James, you wanted in. Yeah, I suppose that ultimately, um, when, if one goes back to why do, do any of us um, learn it's uh, you know to progress ourselves get um, more money as a young person it's that kind of simple thing that inspires people and um, for me the, the culture change comes uh, in a large part through a communications process which shows inspirational people who have achieved great things without having gone to university and there's a, a, a huge amount of them out there if you look at um, the, the way the North East, uh, most of the industries have, have grown up there, particularly oil and gas and food and drink, um, many of the, the fast progressing um, young people have come through um, what I suppose you all call vocational um, uh, type education or modern apprenticeships or apprenticeships of some sort. Um, we just call it, I guess, a, a way to get into a job. Um, and. Uh, so celebrating success has got to be a huge part of it and, and actually how, what that success pathway has been is, is, should be a material really. Um. Okay, thank you. Um, Colin Beatty. Thank you, I've got a wee concern over uh, perhaps understanding of some of the terminology. I'll give you an example. Glasgow City Council um, gave a submission and they stated we need to have a clearer shared understanding of vocational courses and not imagine that vocational courses are in any way worth less than an academic course. Medicine is a vocational course. On the other hand, North Ayrshire Council's submission said, reorganisation schools must not be done at the expense of our highly academic pupils. Scotland's workforce will still require doctors, dentists, lawyers, accountants. So there's two bodies who clearly have a different interpretation of what vocational means. How big a problem is it? And how do we get consistency? Well, I think, I mean, I think it's a, it, it's a, ma it's a massive problem in terms of how societies place hierarchies in terms of jobs. And you know, the, the, the tradition for medicine, for law to be seen as the pinnacles of achievement I think we all have a responsibility to actually challenge what are established orthodoxies in terms of why is medicine? I mean, it's plumbing, for God's sake. <laughs> well, sounds like fighting talk. <laughs> well, why not? I mean, you know, be, be, be provocative. 
uh, you know, yes, there's a lot of theory in there, but, but you know, should we not challenge why do you have to have five A's at higher in order to be a doctor? Does that make the best doctors? And I think medical schools are challenging that. I think medical schools are looking at that they need a wider range of people. So I think we all have a duty to challenge that hierarchy. I think, uh, Chair, uh, Mr Beatty raises a, an interesting question, and I, I think it is partly a question of nomenclature. Um, I do think that traditionally the division between vocational and academic education has been one that where one was seen as being inferior to the other, and we are actually trying to get away from using the term vocational to try to uh, get, get away from, from, uh, from that sort of division. I would be much closer to the Glasgow de uh, definition that you gave than the North Ayrshire, I, I have to say. Um, but I think that to start to talk about uh, you know, education for employment, um, employability skills, uh, these are things that everybody needs. So I, I think that, that, that language you know, is important there. And I wouldn't, uh, for a minute, try to uh, in any way un undermine the importance of academic education and a strong academic uh, educational system is going to be very important to Scotland's future. However, the fact is that in schools traditionally the people who are delivering education are people who have come through the academic route and therefore are predisposed towards thinking that that is the route to success. And it's that sort of mindset that we need to get beyond. And as I go back, I think that there are, there are a number of ways that we do that. One of them can be through changing the terminology that we use, but the other and more powerful one is by illustrating the different routes to success and the sort of opportunities that these can open up for young people. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, think I would agree, uh, Mr. Peter, that, that there is a, almost a conceptual fog and it'd be interesting, I think, if you, if you had a meeting between the people who made those different submissions and talked for long enough, you'd find they're probably talking about the same thing. And I think it's, it's interesting when you do, you know, you look at the surveys over the last five, ten years of employers UK-wide, when you drill down what they're often talking about isn't a narrow vocational definition, it's these more generic skills that will allow people to adapt to change, teamwork and so on. And so. It, the, the boundary between this, the narrow vocation and academic is blurred. But I think it's something perhaps that the work that, that is set out in these reports perhaps has to start addressing first, is to try and get a consensus about what are we talking about here and, and to say, you know, what do we mean by vocation, what do we mean by academic, and then somehow address this parity issue. Sure. Surely, if we can't. Sorry, get sorry a, Colin James. Sorry. So I just, I guess, um, whatever industry we're in, we use jargon, unfortunately, and, and it's usually used within the industry rather than people from outside the industry. And, and as people, somebody from outside the education industry, it is sometimes tricky to get through through all of this stuff. Um, I think ultimately, uh, when again coming back to what makes people employable, uh, nine out of ten people say communication, teamwork. 8 out of 10 will say customer service. You don't actually see any of those things in a, a course syllabus. Um, they're not subjects, they're, they're the things that people can do. And I think as part of this process, we need to move away from um, thinking about subjects and, 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 and a, what has become a, a, a kind of a less challenged way and move more towards what people can actually do. Um, that would be a huge change, but uh, maybe one worth thinking about. Clearly, there's a, there's a problem here if we don't have a consistent approach and a consistent understanding of what the basic terminology means. It seems to me that an awful lot of uh, vocational courses and educational policies are tending to be directed towards pupils that are not performing well academically um, or perhaps are a bit disengaged from school. And that seems to be the box into which vocational courses are being dropped at the moment. How do we move it on? Okay. Uh, I think traditionally, you're right that uh, 
and it, it has tended to happen at, uh, in the old system with standard grades, etc. It's tended to happen at the start of S3 that more disaffected youngsters for whom the traditional curriculum is not seen as appropriate or interesting, they, they are directed into vocational courses. Um, I think that this goes back to a couple of questions earlier on from Mr Griffin and Mr MacArthur, where both of whom talked about the fact that this has got to be embedded at a far earlier stage. And to me, if you're talking about closing the attainment gap and raising attainment and achievement for Scot Scotland's youngsters, we have to see things like developing the young workforce in a much broader context. We have to see it as part of Curriculum for Excellence. We have to look at the initiatives that are taking place uh, elsewhere in Scottish public life, not just education, <coughs> things like the Early Years Collaborative, things like the Scottish Attainment Challenge, which is targeted at primary schools. We have to look at the sort of employability skills that we're starting to get into uh, primary schools. My own patch, for instance, all primary sevens and about half of our schools get a week's work experience in the school kitchen. So if you start to embed that sort of thing and they learn the whole curriculum for a week, groups of them, through the medium of the school kitchen, not just, uh, not just the catering side of it, but the customer service side, the working as a team, etc., etc. And once you start to embed vocational education, or call it what you will, employability skills, into the curriculum, into the <coughs> 3 to 18 curriculum, then you get away from this idea that vocational education is only for the less academic and the more disaffected. So we, as, long as, we, as long as we only offer it in the senior phase to youngsters who are less academic, then we won't get away from that mindset. If we can embed it further down and see it as part part of the core curriculum. After all, Curriculum for Excellence is about skills for learning, skills for life and skills for work. And I think we've still got a way to go in the skills for work agenda. But if we can embed that, that's the way we start to change the, uh, the perceptions. Thank you. Mary? Um, I think um, when we talk about less academic, um, that's possibly not a, a reflection of young people's ability. So because young people don't thrive in a school setting doesn't mean they don't have actually academic potential. Um, what we've currently got, just to remind ourselves, uh, back to the beginning, over 50% of our young people not achieving their full potential and back, for, back to that meaningful attainment. So there are a large number of young people who are partaking in vocational qualifications, not simply those who are disengaged and disaffected from school. Um, and I think always better to try and give a, a real live example, though, of where you see potential really being maximised. And there's a number of pilot projects currently being run across Scotland in a number of the college areas. Um, our particular programme has targeted youngsters in S4, who just got into S4, uh, and in West Lothian, in partnership with the schools, have targeted the four schools who have the lowest performance and the highest deprivation statistics. So we recruited 32 young people, and at the end of S5, that 16 or 17 year old will come out with a full national qualification in manufacturing engineering, a competence based assessed qualification in engineering operations, three core skills in communications, IT and maths, and a raft of more broad and general unit achievement from school. That's a fantastic CV for a 16 or 17 year old coming out of school. Uh, and really, for me, that's the potential that needs to be explored and absolutely grown uh, across Scotland. Okay, thank you. Colin, can I just, uh, just do one follow-up on that? I mean, we're, I think we're agreed about this, this problem of uh, effectively how it's viewed in terms of uh, academic and vocational and sort of general culture of, of the country. Um, but isn't the fundamental problem that you'll, you'll never shift that while um, Effectively, it's, it's not what people don't want to pursue academic or vocational qualifications for their children. What they want is status and financial security. Um, and effectively, while, while status and financial security is tied up with succeeding academically, um, then that's the, way, that's the way that parents and schools and everybody else will, and, the, and the culture and society will continue to push children and will be seen as the preferred outcome. So isn't the problem a much more fundamental one about, about that status and about that financial reward in society from being you know, uh, somebody who achieves very well uh, academically as opposed to somebody who goes down the vocational route? Isn't, isn't that a fundamental problem in society rather than us trying to you know, 
muck about with uh, you know this course versus that course? Well, I think it is, mm. um, but 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 I think uh, I, I mean I think there there have been inroads into that in terms of I mean I was talking earlier about that hierarchy. I I don't necessarily think the medical profession is quite as far up the tree as it was, say, in my father's generation. So I think society has changed. I think society is much more uh, critical and challenging of some of the established, um, uh, established professions. Uh, and, and I think there, there are other professions developing that, that, that were, were, were not around 20 or 30 years ago. So the, the, the hierarchy is, is just that little bit more fluid. But we were talking about employers and I was talking about hospitality and tourism. If we're trying to encourage more young people into hospitality and tourism, then those who are running those industries have to think about career progression within that. So from an educational point of view, if we are helping to provide uh, better skilled young people who have aspirations within that industry, then employers then have a responsibility to think about a career framework within their industry in order to keep them, which comes back to that partnership model that we were talking about. Okay, thank you. I'll just bring, I'll bring in check at this point. Yeah. 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 Just come back to <coughs> the parental involvement, the, the question that, that we had. In, in the Economy Committee, when we looked at underemployment and various aspects of employment last year, the problem was that nobody saw uh, the, the parental involvement is required. For example, we're very short of engineers. Uh, the number of women involved in, in the engineering industry, particularly in oil and gas, uh, is reflective of the fact that they're either in admin or of the ones that are on the oil rigs are in catering because it's seen as a dirty job by, by parents. And I just wonder what mechanism there is. And I know that you know, the excellent work that QMU do when we've had this conversation about the hospitality industry. I mean, what do we do to embrace parents and help them understand exactly what opportunities are available in, uh, through academic or vocational uh, qualification in industries like the ones I've just mentioned? How do we get them convinced that they should have a wider uh, perspective on things. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, so the new uh, chief executive of uh, Oil and Gas UK is a is a lady, dear Dumihi. So, um, so that's one kind of positive and very visible step that um, that has been made within that sector. And uh, it's a small step, but actually, I think having v visible role models again is is really you know really important to young people. Um, Within the North East, we've just started to roll out uh, an evaluation tool for all business and, and education um, links. And one of the stakeholders that we ask about um, in that is parents. So I think for a parent, um, and, and I speak as one, but uh, you, you're often not visible, um, don't have full visibility of what's going on um, within the schools. And I think again... Why? Uh, um, sorry? Why? Um, there's a, again two-way thing. It's like with employers. I think there's an imperative on both sides. Um, you'll have uh, some parents who are very engaged, and who will take an active role in securing work experience. Some who, as I said earlier, may be less well networked, for example, and feel unable to do that. So I think, from an employer's side, we need to open up that access to to all parents and all pupils to give the same level of opportunity across the board, not just to the ones that are as, uh, particularly well connected. I'm going to try and answer your question, but I might go off on a wee tangent just to start with. But um, in, in involving parents, and we've been talking about em employability to do with education, but I think we need to think about education in a slightly broader sense. And if I take the example of the Children's University, the Children's University is to try and use the idea that not all young people will be turned on by the formal curriculum within schools. Therefore, we try and use other activities that young people are involved in and try to get them to see the learning potential around them. And if you look at a lot of the activities around schools, it tends to be a lot of um, uh, the mothers that are involved. So how do we get fathers involved? So using sport, 
through the Children's University and getting young people and getting fathers involved in, uh, in helping out with sports teams or swimming or, 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 or whatever. So I think it's about trying to have a renegotiation of the relationship within education between young people, parents, schools, employers. You have to allow the parents in, they have to see that where there's a role for them and mm -hmm. for some parents, schools are big fright scary places, either, either because they've had bad experiences themselves or just because the school has that kind of formal aura about it. So there's quite a lot of breaking down barriers to be done here. And again, one of the things with the Children's University is you have regular graduation. So the children, I don't know how much you know about the Children's University, but it's mm -hmm. a system that's accredited and they get stamps and children love getting stamps. And once you've got a certain number of stamps, you can graduate and you come to the university and therefore you come with your parents. So you're actually coming into a higher, higher education institution. The parents are coming in, the young children are coming in, they've got their bonnets on and their gowns and what have you. Um, but it's seen not to be such a scary educational place. Breaking down barriers, I think, is really important. Just building on what Alan said there about, I think you have to engage with parents first, regardless if you want to engage them in education, to get them to look at the, you know, the value of vocational education, whatever it is, the agenda. The, one of the big challenges across education at the moment is engaging with parents. And I think in the research we've seen in the past, if parents can be engaged closely at school and you can demonstrate that what you're doing makes a difference to the, the quality of life for the, their child and the life opportunities, they're more likely to become engaged. And then once that sort of relationship starts building, you can then engage them in the in debates about, you know, life choices, course choices, and so on. But I think there's, there's, there's that fundamental level. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want to move on. Um, now coming, oh, you've got a small supplementary? Well, a, small supplementary. well, a quick supplementary from Gordon, then I'll bring in right. I mean, you, you mentioned the importance of parents and, and parents' attitude, etc. But, you know, I, I've got, if we're really wanting to try and close the attainment gap uh, between those individuals that are uh, from our most marginalised communities as opposed to the rest of the general population. How do we get parents to switch on to uh, the importance of education full stop, not just vocational or academic edu education, when you know, they're, they're in a situation where they might be juggling zero-hour contracts, they might be part-time jobs that they're having to deal with, they've got DWP sanctions. You know, unfortunately, in that scenario, their children's education is pretty low down because they've got the stresses of everyday life. So, you know, how, how, does, how does that play? And if you're going to turn this round, how does that play? That illustrates the, the wide spectrum of the challenge here. Yeah. And I think there are some really good examples across Scotland and, and wider, but certainly in Scotland, of schools and partnerships, educational communities that are doing just that. And it is by thinking more radically and innovating and going out into the community, you know, almost outreach, working with community learning and, and sort of partnership work. So it's not just education, education is one part of that. Mm. And it's these more innovative, uh, outward looking approaches that are starting to engage with parents and making a difference. And I think right through this you know, proposed programme here, it's looking for examples that work like that and trying to mobilise that knowledge across the system and translate it as appropriate to different contexts. But I think we, there is practice out there that, that has already started doing that. But it does, it needs innovation, it needs creativity and, and a bit of risk taking. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay, well, v very, very quick answer if you don't mind. I want to move on, but Mary and, and Terry want to... Uh, I think just to, to reinforce the point in that parents who are, are struggling are nonetheless every bit as committed and want the best for their children. It's their ability to support their children mm. that needs more support. And that's where I think we, as the um, organisations who are tasked with supporting them, um, have to use our very best resources and interventions at the very best time to get the best outcomes for those young people. And that can only be achieved in partnership with others in the, the schools and local authorities. But that's absolutely our, our duty. Okay, thank you. Terry, very briefly. Yeah, very briefly. It's, uh, I, I think you're right that it's, this is a, a big challenge to engage this, this group of parents. And I think it's not just 
education alone that has responsibility for that. I think that the society has a, a responsibility to try to pull them, those, uh, these parents into the system. And, to fight, and schools do need imaginative ways to engage them. Having said that, I do think another important factor is that if we make the curriculum more meaningful to young people, if we enthuse young people about learning, including the young people from the most disadvantaged groups, then that is a way in which ultimately parents will become more engaged. Because one of the issues has been that youngsters from these disadvantaged groups have become disengaged from education. If we can get them talking positively about their experience, if we can address their needs through school, and there's some evidence that we're beginning to do that with better staying on rates, etc., from uh, more deprived uh, areas, then that's a way, I think, of pulling parents in. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mary. Uh, this is Okay, um, sorry, I was daydreaming there, so... Um, you should never say that. <laughs> I know. Uh, we're talking about um, attainment in the Wood Commission, and I'm just slightly concerned about the way that the discussion's going, because it seems to be that you get to the age of 14 and 15, and then we think, oh, gosh, we've got a problem, we better do something. And uh, the conveners will not forgive me for raising Audit Scotland again, but in the report last year... Um, I have to say, I was quite shocked that, um, you know, for example, you've got Inverclyde and East Lothian, same level attainment, but hugely different levels of deprivation. Uh, you know, so I just, deprivation is not the only answer here. I think the second thing that shocked me, there's no independent evaluation of what councils spend on schools and uh, the achievements and attainment and uh, wider achievement. And I think probably the most concerning thing is there's no consistent approach to tracking and monitoring pupils from primary one to S3. And then, you know, just the final point, 2% um, of primary sevens don't work at the expected level of numeracy. Two years later, 35% of pupils don't achieve the level of numeracy. So uh, my point is that I'm just concerned that because we're looking at attainment and the Wood Commission that we're assuming that there's not a problem until somebody's age 14. Um, and, you know, if you look at the unemployment rates, 2013 for 16 to 24-year-olds, the average, and we're very good at looking at averages, is 21%. It's 8% for those that have a degree, but the unemployment rate for people with no qualifications is 47. And so... I'm kind of concerned. I mean, I love the Wood Commission. I support every single element of it. But it's not the only answer to attainment and achievement. So I think uh, what I'm asking for my first question is, you know, what is being done in schools? And we can't expect to start looking at this at age 14 or when people are unemployed. So according to Audit Scotland, we're not doing enough in schools. Um, so can I maybe just ask you to address that before I ask my second question? If I could just... First thing, and then Kevin, if you don't mind. Uh, thanks, Chair. I would go back to my earlier answer. I, 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 I would absolutely uh, agree that we can't say that you suddenly get to 14 and then recognise a problem. Um, I think that the, 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 this work has to be seen in the, in the context of the 3 to 18 curriculum, the whole Curriculum for Excellence uh, model, uh, the work that we're doing with the Early Years Collaborative, the work that we're doing for the Scottish Attainment, about to start, and the Scottish Attainment Challenge in, in primary schools. This is part of a much bigger picture. You put your uh, the, your finger on an issue about the, 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 the lack of, of a consistent monitoring uh, in the, uh, 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 through the primary stages in terms of attainment and, and as a result of that and into primary early secondary and into early secondary yeah. and as a result of that the vast majority of local authorities, including my own, have gone for uh, standardised assessments. We've got them at primary 3, 5, 7 and S2. Uh, so we are beginning to build up uh, a body of data that, uh, that, uh, that does give a robust uh, measure that's, of that's attainment. That's not in every local authority. It's not in every local authority, but one of the aims of the Scottish Attainment Challenge is to look at the use of data in the primary and early secondary school uh, to see whether there is something that we can do to measure 
to, uh, to, to measure more robustly the attainment levels. I think you, you put your finger on a significant challenge, but I would dispute the idea that we only see it as a problem at the age of 14. I would, I would draw your attention to all those other initiatives and to the work that's going on in schools to try to address this at the earliest possible stage. Early and effective intervention is what everyone recognises works here. Exactly what Terry said, but I think what is also happening in Scotland is we're starting to see a shift in teacher professional roles and identity in their culture, where they are becoming more reflective practitioners. So that there is, you know, external and, and sort of monitoring built into the system. But I think teachers are also becoming far better at reflecting on the learning of their and uh, and strategies. But I think you've, you've you've accurately provided a pen portrait of the challenge and the wider context, okay. and this is just part of addressing that. Okay, my second question, uh, convener. Um, I did read the uh, Aberdeen uh, and Grampian Chamber of Commerce, and I was actually, being a, pre a lecturer before I came in here in further and higher education, I was actually surprised that the colleges barely got a passing mention. And um, so I think my question, uh, Chick Brodie and some of us at Wester Hales last week, we asked a question about colleges. And um, I was actually surprised at how much the school wanted to work with the college, but actually how difficult they found it. And I think my colleagues would agree with me. Uh, they were saying that they had resources for car mechanics and they could fill it if only they could get a lecturer to come in once or twice a week. And the engagement from the colleges wasn't good. Um, so I think, uh, first of all, Aberdeen and Grampian, barely a passing mention, but secondly, are the, co are the colleges, I know there have been a lot of challenges with the mergers, etc. Um, forgive me for saying this, but it was said to me, the colleges are too busy being universities that they've taken their eye off vocational education and the colleges need to do more about engaging with schools. Now, I'm not talking about the whole of Scotland. This comment was made in Edinburgh in relation to Edinburgh College. But in order for this to work, we've all got to work together rather than pass the buck. So, um... I'll, uh, yeah. Marry. I'll, I'll respond uh, mm -hmm. directly on that. Um, the, uh, the, the primary body of work we've, we've had um, in this area is between uh, employers and schools, and so the fit uh, with, 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 uh, with, with wood has been strong. But, um, the, the omission, as, as you say, of a uh, uh, comment on college, colleges is not um, necessarily um, to be seen as a bad thing. One of the things that we, that we have in the North East is, a, is, well, it was two, it's now one particularly strong college with two campuses, Aberdeen and Fraserborough. Um, there are actually um, some really good practices being embedded between the schools and the colleges in the North East. In particular, we're starting to now see um, a more, and this is something we welcome, flexible approach to learning within the schools and the colleges. So people being released from school time to learn their, their trade, their education, whatever you want to call it, within the colleges. And I think that kind of uh, more flexible approach to learning, allowing uh, young people access to college provision during school time, is something that uh, we already see happening, and, and in that respect, you know, uh, uh, we don't need, see the need to particularly reflect on it in any great depth, um, and, and so it's a really positive thing. Um, I, I mean, first of all, I'm really disappointed to hear that there's, um, you know, a request being made to work with a college and it's not been taken forward, and I can't speak to the individual circumstances of any one institution. However, um, what I would say very strongly in my own experience is that colleges in most parts of Scotland play a very key and pivotal role with the schools in the development of vocational qualifications. The quality and evidence base of the college school partnerships is actually quite stunning in some areas. I think there's maybe work to be done about that being consistent across, across Scotland. And I think we could do that more by learning about and sharing about the best practice that, that we do see. Um, but I think actually colleges are such an integral part of partnership working um, you know, that, that can never be understated. So and what I would be confident about, I'm quite sure, is that 
if that problem was raised and taken forward, you know, it would be very seriously um, taken and very seriously addressed because I think as a sector, uh, we are known to be very proactive, uh, responsive and utterly committed to partnership working for the benefit of our young people. Okay, thank you. Uh, Terry? I was also disappointed in the reference in the, the, the account of the visit to Wester Hales about the comment about the college. I suppose one of the things about the final report from the Wood Commission was that it highlighted that there is an issue, as Vary says, of consistency across the country. And, um, the, and I think that goes not just for the college uh, liaison, but for all aspects of this work. You can probably find good examples of all yeah. of the 39 recommendations, or most of them, somewhere in Scotland, but it's about getting that embedded. I have to say that my own experience is very different from that with colleges. We have an excellent relationship with West College Scotland. I serve in the college's uh, Learning, Teaching and Quality Committee. Uh, we've got college lecturers working in our schools. Our youngsters go to college college on both day release and longer uh, basis. Uh, we work very closely together on a whole range of initiatives. And I hear my colleagues talk like that uh, uh, elsewhere in Scotland. It might not be universal, but I think there's lots of good practice there. And one of the challenges, I think, uh, in the final report of the Wood Commission is for us to identify where there is good practice and make sure that that is shared right across the country, because it's there already. It's just not there everywhere. Okay. It just, it, it's, very, it, it's within my section, a very small question. Well, one final small question. Yes, it's, it, it's very small, but it's Aberdeen Chamber of Commerce. And I was very disappointed to read that uh, your members consider that young people receive poor or incorrect information about careers and work opportunities in particular sector. Uh, this change needs to be embedded in primary and secondary schools. So I think that would be a concern to this committee if uh, pupils are getting poor and incorrect information at schools. Um, uh, again, I hope uh, the is uh, not a disappointment on us reporting it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something we get told frequently. Um, one of the areas which we think there's an opportunity to uh, embed, again, a different type of behaviour and activity is actually engaging employers in the process of providing uh, careers guidance into schools. Um, it would be unfair, I think, to uh, expect that teachers, whatever type of teacher you are, can actually give accurate uh, careers advice uh, because you're a teacher and that's your job and uh, they're you know, professionals in their own way. Um, SDS get... are supposed to be doing it. I think even saying that, though, SDS... Um, can access the knowledge of employers who are much more up to date on what jobs exist. And we've heard earlier that actually jobs are, are, and, and, and role, roles are continually changing and will be very different in another 10 years. So the best people to give advice on what jobs are out there and what skills you need are the people who are employing. And I think you know, there's a great opportunity to, to look at this um, area and uh, use employers to, to, to be of benefit to young people. Um, it's, it's a huge opportunity and one which I think we should uh, snap up. Okay, thank you. I just, just for everybody's information, we will have separate sessions with SDS and Education Scotland as we go through this mm -hmm. process. But Kevin, you want to take just going to say, what's, what seems to be underpinning a lot of what's been talked about here is really coordination and almost brokering because I think you have you know, approaches from schools to colleges, uh, the role of careers at primary school and so on. But we've seen this in the past where there's been studies that have worked well. Uh, almost case studies, and it's really almost thinking within a local context, local partnerships, there's a need perhaps for some brokering, organisational, you know, there's the, a sort of coordinating body or individuals who can sort of <coughs> make the links and create the liaison. Yeah. Otherwise, people talk past each other. Yeah. And um, just, I mean, that's where the regional investing youth groups are absolutely crucial. They're the people who can see all of this going on, who can, you know, make best use of resources, help agencies consolidate the resource they do have and use it in a, a, a more effective way. OK, thank you very much. Uh, a, a very, a, I'm, I'm assured a very quick supplementary from Siobhan McMahon. It should be. It was based on uh, the evidence we heard at Wester Hills, but obviously the evidence that was given, in particular from Mr or the West of College, uh, West of Scotland Colleges um, in your area about St Peter the Apostle, about schools wishing to engage, so you said the engineering course, into colleges, but the timetable not starting when the school term starts, and therefore pupils are left for four or five weeks 
um, not being able to get to college. Is that the case in that particular example? And if it isn't the case, what should we be doing to change that across the board? What resources need to be in place so that people, when they start their school term, can go to college from, from that off rather than waiting on colleges starting as well? Terry? Our uh, college courses start within a week of the start of the school okay. term, and uh, it's the. I think you mentioned the Peter the Apostle example. That's the the uh, the engineering uh, the, um, HNC that I mentioned earlier. The key to that was that the school was prepared to be flexible in their approach to timetabling, and the college was prepared to be flexible. They basically ripped up the timetable because it was an opportunity for a particular group of youngsters for whom this was an appropriate uh, route. And I think increasingly, and as in the ADES uh, written evidence, it says this, that we, we need to uh, look afresh at the senior phase timetabling, so that it's not so much a, a menu approach where you take it or leave it. It's about what do you want as an individual youngster to get from your senior phase, uh, and then we'll do our best to, to make sure that you can get it. And that's what happened in this case, and that was the key to its success. Okay, thank you. Uh very just, briefly, Alan. just very quickly, yeah. just to reassure you, in terms of the, the, the work that we do in, uh, in the academies, there's huge flexibility. We're working with over 50 schools uh, now, Edinburgh College, West Lothian College, um, Borders College, uh, and there really has been that flexibility in terms of moving young people around the country so that their education is in their school, in a college, at the university, and in work. And we've managed to get, okay, it wasn't easy to start with, but that flexibility is now there in the system. Okay, thank you. George Adam. Thank you, Convener. Well, I'm actually following on from that because I was talking about schools and colleges and the flexibility between the two. Obviously, it's a major part of the Wood Report and uh, it's, we've gone on it at some length. But to, just to mention about uh, West College Scotland, you know, they mentioned in their uh, submissions at school timetables and how subjects are placed across them. Can at times lack flexibility? There was also a mention from SDS themselves that a flexibility of a consistent approach to school and college timetable across Scotland within local authorities or regions where needed could avoid duplication of resource, and which is a subject that constantly comes up at this committee as well with regards to uh, uh, kind of the covering education. The other thing that was when we were at Wester Hales Education Centre, they told us how they effectively, as you quite rightly said, Terry, ripped up the timetabling and found a way to make it work for them. That kind of flexibility. Now, I was quite impressed with that, not just because the head teacher is a fellow Paisley buddy, but uh, I don't think that's the only reason why the school's been reasonably successful. Might be one of them. But uh, the other things is, uh, you know, they were so flexible. Now, how do we get to that place? How do we get to that type of flexibility throughout Scotland where we can effectively, as you say, Terry, the, 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 the young person takes control of, because that's how they're going to buy in, whether it be vocational or academic, is when they take control of their destiny and their future. And I was very impressed last week with some of the young people at Wester Hales who were telling us exactly what they were doing and how they'd bought into this. And how do we get, how do we get teachers to buy into it as well? I'm going to start with Mary. Mary. Um, I, I think um, what we have to look at is making sure that in areas where we're trying to be really flexible, that that fits the needs of the area. The danger would be that you try and impose a flexible model across Scotland, which would not actually um, be fit for purpose in all areas. So uh, the, in terms of the logistics, and there are serious logistics um, challenges in working between colleges and schools. However, in my experience, you know, if the partnership working locally is very, very strongly focused on the common goals for young people, then underneath that, what you need is a very, very good infrastructure to tackle the logistics. And so in West Lothian, all 11 secondary schools have come together with common timetabling options so that young people can travel to college. And that was done a number of years ago because we wanted to open up the options for young people. And the college sits on the senior phase timetabling group. We sit on the opportunities for all group. We work with the head teachers. So we are embedded in the infrastructure, which allows us to actually listen and understand the logistical challenges, but to make sure we deliver on the ground the programmes that young people need. And I think that only comes about as a result of working seriously and closely in partnership with our colleagues in the schools and education services. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, just in addition to that, I mean, we've got a similar situation that we've got common timetabling elements, and that enables not just 
travel to college, but also travel between schools, so that you, you do get the most efficient timetable possible. Uh, I would say that it does need leadership at the centre, though, because uh, if schools are left on their own, they will tend to you know, do what, what they can in their own, within their own resources. So it's about, it's about leading and coordinating that at the centre and making sure that you, uh, that, that you timetable across the schools. And I have to say that once schools see the advantages for their youngsters, because we have been greatly, for instance, and this is a more academic uh, aspect of it, uh, the, by changing the way that we timetabled last year, we almost doubled uh, uh, numbers of youngsters who were able to get advanced hires because we maximised the opportunities across the, uh, across the five secondary schools. We're fortunate it's a small local authority in a small geographical area, and we made the most of that. So big advantages that you uh, can convince schools to, to do it. Okay. Kevin? With Marion Terry, I identified some really excellent case studies there. And it's using those almost as a, an illustration to other mm. situations in, uh, around Scotland and say, what can we learn from that? And how do you, you know, it's, it, it, it's always wary of taking something and transplanting it. It's a case of translating it and saying, mm. here's a model, this is how we did it. How would you fine tune it for your context? So I think it's using those as, as inspiration, case studies, and also building in their careful evaluation so that we know what the impact is, as you're saying, that we, we know that something works and we know it works over time. And, yeah. Well, in Western Hale's case, uh, the deputy head said that he had to get buy-in from the staff for a start mm -hmm. to, to yeah. say that we can work differently. Now, the, the problem uh, and his fear, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing what he said, was that they were pro going through process instead of actually educating young people. And uh, they, had, uh, they embraced the curriculum for excellence totally. I think much of what you've already said yourself and, and managed to get teachers to teach again as opposed to processing. And I thought that was quite valid because with quite a lot of the evidence that we get in various things, we do come back to this idea of uh, you know, teachers wanting to, how, what is my end game? Where do I end up? Where's the exam? And working back. And I was quite, it was good to hear a place where it was successful, where they'd actually found a way to actually have an ongoing evaluation as well. Uh, and it was just, uh, it was one of these things that just makes you want to say, how can we not have that flexibility elsewhere? To your work, and how do we how do we engage with the unions and everyone else to get to that place? Yes, Alan. It's interesting that staff haven't really been mentioned that much up until now, and I think it's a really important point. And one of the unintended consequences of the academies project was actually getting teaching teams in schools, speaking to the teaching teams in colleges, and speaking to the teaching teams in the universities, and all sharing their expectations and what they're doing and actually then helping to understand what's happening to somebody when they're 14, 15, and then what's going to happen to them when they're 18, 19. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's real benefits in that cross-fertilisation between staff groups. OK, George. Yep. Liam. Uh, just very briefly, I think one of the other things that Deputy Head was telling us in Wester uh, Hales Education Centre was that um, it wasn't until they moved to the 3 plus 3 model and away from 2 plus 2 plus 2 that they actually found that they were able to adopt the flexible approach that uh, others have, have referred to. So we'd be interested to know whether um, the panel feels that that really is a um, sine qua non in terms of, of, of making the kind of progress we're looking to make. And the other thing I found, um, I think, very interesting about what we were being told last week was that um, the, the, the teaching staff um, were able to tell where each of the pupils wa was at any given stage in any month on any subject. And given all the stuff we've heard about the um, workload pressures and over-assessment in the rollout of National 4 or 5, maybe to a lesser extent, uh, when, when you hires, again, it'd be interested to know um, the, the, the panel's views on whether this is a, a realistic ambition for schools across the country. Because presumably, if, if Wester Hills Education Centre can do it and it appears to, to, to be delivering results and seems to be bedding in pretty successfully, then it's not beyond the realms of possibility of, 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 of achieving that across the board. Um, I think that, that uh, schools are becoming more and more sophisticated about tracking and monitoring and using technology to track and monitor the progress of young people so that you can actually get a very clear picture. And CMIS provides a, a module that allows you to do that quite effectively. Um, I think uh, that it's the, your question about the 3 plus 3, 2 plus 2, 
I mean, I would ag agree that I think that, that people are beginning to see a, a, a clearer picture about the broad general education and the transfer into uh, the senior phase. Um, however, it's quite interesting that probably the, the waters have been more muddied because th 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 there's probably now more uh, divergence in the, the, the curricular models that are being offered. Um, the elements of choice are being introduced in some schools uh, by the end of S1, others by the end of S2. Um, that, I mean, and we need to remember that uh, uh, personalisation and choice are an entitlement within, within curriculum for excellence. So, in a sense, the, I, I, I sense that the 3 plus 3 v 2 plus 2 plus 2 is maybe a dead argument now that we're moving into a, a period where uh, of refinement where where uh, the schools are looking again at their curriculum our schools are all looking again at the broad general education and they're changing uh, what they're doing as far as the workload issue is concerned uh, i'm halfway through uh, the reviews the annual reviews of the secondary schools where we go out and spend a whole day in each of them and uh, we've been talking about workload and about where teachers are at the moment and the feeling from the schools that have been in so far is very much that this is a better year than last year that the pressures uh, on the, the, uh, for introducing the National Fives in particular last year, uh, that has settled. People are much more comfortable with it. They seem to be uh, more confident with the new hires where these have been introduced, that they dovetail uh, well with the National Fives that, that they were doing last year. And so while there are still significant workload issues, which I'm sure you'll hear from EIS and others, um, I think the, the, the general feeling is that last year was particular pressure and that things are improving uh, this session. Hey, Gordon MacDonald. Um, I'm keen to understand the role of employers in this whole attainment um, agenda. And I've got a couple of quotes just to read out to start. All pupils over the age of 14 must have an opportunity to, for work-based vocational learning linked to accompanying relevant qualifications. This will require a major commitment from Scotland's employers working closely with local authorities in secondary schools. And another quote, there must be a major expansion in the involvement of businesses in our schools. All primary, secondary and special schools must develop partnership agreements with local businesses and other appropriate organisations. That's a quote from a Scottish executive report determined to succeed in 2003. So, Given that the Wood Commission has similar um, recommendations, what are the challenges in actually getting employers involved in education? Um, the uh, the determined to succeed thing comes up every now and again when uh, I'm in meetings with uh, people who were involved in this. 12 or 13 years ago, I guess. So, uh, so it's not the, 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 the first time I've heard that, I guess. The, um, the fact is that um, we are seeing, uh, I suppose, a latent demand. There's, there's employers out there who want to do this stuff. So about 70% would say they, they want to get engaged in it, but only about a third are actually engaged in it. With it. So you have, you have an opportunity there. So that's the first thing. We've got something to go at. Um, what we get told is that, um, first of all, we've got a, maybe more at this, the small, medium enterprise end, um, a difficulty of knowing how to, to, to do it. What, what do they have to do and um, how can we get engaged? And I suppose that's not knowing how to contact a school. It might sound fairly easy if you phone up the head teacher, but actually that, that's a barrier in itself. So I think... Um, the but that was 12, that's 12 years ago. Ab absolutely, you know? yeah. I, I can only to work out how to pick up the phone to the school. So, so we've obviously not moved on very far. <laughs> so from, uh, from uh, the invest in youth side of things, uh, I think we need to go down the route of some kind of standardisation for the smaller businesses, which allows um, a very simple, you know, for want of a better word, a template approach to um, giving them the guidance. Uh, and I, as I say, can't comment for what's happened in the last 12 years because this is only something we've been involved in for the last year and a half. And I think that type of approach is something which small businesses are saying that they would welcome. Um, at, the, at the larger end, uh, I mean, there are pretty active partnerships in the North East that are, that are working really pretty well. Um, and actually, the majority of the schools do have 
a strong business partnership. So, um, so again, we've spoken about case studies and examples. Uh, I, I think we just need to look at them and, and, uh, and, and look at how they work because they, they're, they're achieving really positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. okay, Terry. Yeah, I think one of the challenges here, Chair, in, uh, the, in this aspect of the agenda is the, the very differing labour markets that exist across Scotland. Uh, Western Berkshire is very different from the North East, for instance. So the Council is by far the biggest employer in the area. So one of the challenges is we've got to take the lead as an employer in the area in engaging uh, with uh, and not just education but other, other Council departments. And we've got two or three medium to big players like Agreco and Polaroid, BAE Systems. And it's comparatively easy to get them to engage in this process. And in fact, they're very enthusiastic and very supportive. One of the big challenges is about most of our employers aren't even SMEs, they're micro-businesses, they're one-guy and two-guy uh, operations. And so how do you persuade them that there's something, both something in it for them and that they have something to offer? And I think we have to become quite inventive about incentivising small and medium businesses and micro-businesses to uh, engage in this. Um, the, for instance, a lot of very small businesses find it very hard to, uh, to, to uh, employ apprentices. So we have to find a way of, do, uh, of doing that by perhaps delivering part of apprenticeships, uh, the academic side of it, in schools, by joining up colleges, uh, employers and schools together uh, to, to do that so that there's less downtime for the small employer where the, uh, the, 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 the apprentices, uh, at, you know, traditionally at college, can that be done while, while the young person's still at school? Um, and I, I, one of the big challenges, I think, will be in engaging uh, SMEs and very small businesses in this process. The bigger businesses, it's, it's easier because they, they, yeah. they have the capacity to do it. Mm -hmm fundamental to the strategy, the engagement employers at all levels. And I think we see in, in, in the past, if we look south of the border, there's been a, a real issue of engaging with, getting employers to engage with schools. I think it's a different context in Scotland, but we do have, <coughs> as you say, a range of different employer sizes. And in some cases, employers may be transient. You know, if you think about the vagaries of the economic system, some employers may feel they're able to engage with schools over a one, two, three year period but then the market turns or the employer unfortunately disappears, what happens then? So we have to build some recognition of that into the system. Uh, but I think it's, it is right, it's, it's how do you engage? And it goes back to what I was saying earlier about having some sort of focus, a partnership in an area that's coordinated and somebody saying, you know, again, brokering mm. to try and, because I think for all partners, it'll be what's in it for them. And yes, there may be a shared commitment to the, the outcomes for young people, but they also want, and it's looking at incentives, and, but I think it's fundamental, the whole strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I mean, only about half of businesses are taking on young people and work experience because they think it's of benefit to them, which, which is surprising, actually. Yeah. I think, um, bizarrely, the, the, the companies who are probably best suited to give a broad experience to young people are micro-businesses, because in a week, you can get an experience of finance, sales, uh, HR, you know, they do everything. So if we can make it easy for those companies, we've got, you know, that's, that's the big opportunity for me. Yeah. But how, how do we make it easier for, for businesses then? Because, you know, we, we'll, when we were at Wester Hills, which happens to be in my constituency, I, so if nobody else is going to mention it, I was, um, the people said they had a positive view of work experience and considered that slightly longer placements of around four weeks were better than a one or two week placement. Placements were a good means of boosting confidence and increasing work readiness. So the pupils themselves yeah. have recognised the benefit of work experience. How do we actually get um, employers, if the majority are micro employers, how do we get that one or two man business to actually offer that work yeah. so, so there's been the right challenge put to employers to do this stuff. The, the, the challenge back, I think, to the education sector is how do you create a flexible timetabling system and embed um, the opportunity within timetabling for the old, as you used to get Wednesday afternoon release, four weeks, you know, different models of work experience because the, the, the old one-week work experience really isn't, isn't fit for purpose in terms of 
allowing different employers the flexibility to, to act. So I think um, employers can do so much, and I think it's then incumbent on them to work in partnership with the education system um, to, to work around some of those challenges you have for providing a consistent level of service across hundreds of pupils. Mm. And, and I suspect it's not easy, but we need to work it out. <clears throat> Terry. Can I just give you an example from the local perspective? About six years ago, we decided that the, the week's work experience in S4 just wasn't fit for purpose, so we ripped it up completely. And we, what we now offer is every young person uh, the opportunity of a bespoke work experience uh, or work placement um, in the year that they leave school because, of course, more and more youngsters are staying on until sixth year now, so why would you do your work experience in S4? Um, and often in the past, it wasn't related to the youngsters' aspirations or, or aptitudes. So that's what we now do, and it can still be the one week, uh, if that's appropriate, it can, but it can, be half a, it can be half a day a week for a term. It can be, uh, it, it can be three weeks spread through the year. Uh, depending on the nature of the placement, etc. Now, one of the advantages of that is that by engaging with local employers, um, we are able to talk to them about what they can offer, because the full week isn't easy for some employers to offer, whereas half a day a week um, or work at weekends, for instance, might be something that, they, that, uh, that, that would suit them. So we've got a whole range of different, uh, of, of, of different models which are suited to the young person and are, are based on what the young person is looking for and on what the local labour market can offer. Okay, Alan. I think, just very briefly, I think when you asked the question how to get employers involved, I think we've talked a lot about engagement. Um, we, we, we've talked a lot about um, uh, people's contributions feeling valued. Uh, when we were setting up the Hospitality Tourism Academy, we involved employers in designing the curriculum. And it wasn't, well, we need this piece of um, industry-specific knowledge. It was, um, uh, as was said earlier by James, it was about we want communication, we want team working, we want discipline, we want attitude, we want those kind of soft skills. I don't know why they're always called soft skills, which seems demeaning, because they're some of the most important skills that, um, that we all need. Thank you. Um, the, the, my last question, question is on the situation of um, employment opportunities for young people. If we're going to um, show the importance of vocational training, etc., then there has to be an outcome for young people at the end of it. And currently we're in a scenario where most of the employment opportunities given to young people tend to be in retail, hospitality and tourism. So, you know, I read a report which said that um, in the North Sea, over the next five years, there's something like 5,000, uh, sorry, 12,000 new entrants over the next five years. It was in the Opito report, fueling the next generation. So given that there are these opportunities coming up, what can we do to encourage more employers to take on school leavers and maybe put them through the modern apprenticeship scheme, et cetera, to show the importance of vocational training? The, uh, the oil and gas industry, one thing it is pretty good at is getting young people in the, into the industry and, it, um, and uh, how you get people from, you know, wh wherever in the, in the UK to decide, actually, I want to move to the North East or move to Glasgow, whatever the supply chain is, 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 is a slightly different question. I guess it's about making industry look attractive. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the getting people into modern apprenticeships. I mean, one of the challenges that some employers tell me is that we've got a, uh, an economic strategy which talks about um, getting people into these kind of higher value jobs, but actually the, the funding for um, the apprenticeships for engineering is the same as customer service, and actually the cost of delivering um, an engineering apprenticeship is much higher. So you're getting companies who do it, like SCORE, for example, who are really good at this stuff, um, because they want to do it, because they've got a, a leader who thinks it's important. If there was a, we, it may be worth looking at the relative financial incentives in these areas to actually um, prop up our um, prop up our industrial strategy and economic strategy, and, and, and make sure that they, they feed properly into each other. Um, so, okay, thank you. Uh, a very brief supplementary yeah. check. Project. Yes, it will be. Uh, it, at the end of the day, once we, uh, you know, uh, partially close the gap, there is an overarching strategy for the for the country. And, and one of the things that we we need are more entrepreneurs 
and business people. I mean, look at QMU covering four academies, which are critical, uh, or the basis of it, critical to, to the future economy of, of the country. How much do you think we inculcate a, the spirit of entrepreneurialism in, in the curriculum? Okay. Uh, I think we could do more. Um, I think I would accept that. I think that there are examples of, of, uh, of, of good practice. Um, I think young, young enterprise, so the schools that really embrace young enterprise and take it seriously, uh, then you can have extremely good outcomes from that. Uh, the Youth Philanthropy Initiative, I think, is a, a very valuable, um, it's not just about entrepreneurship, but it's, it touches on that. Um, the, I think that we could go uh, a good bit further and um, that we, it's probably an area that a lot of teachers don't feel terribly confident in because it's not something that they, are, uh, th that they have been trained to, uh, to develop. But it's, uh, I suppose if you look at popular culture these days and the, the, the roles that prominent entrepreneurs play, like Sir Alan Sugar and uh, Richard Branson, people like that, there's probably uh, a, a way to, to really appeal to young people in that whole agenda. So uh, I think there's a way to go. Yes, Alan. I think it's a fascinating question because so much about education is about putting things in boxes. And entrepreneurialism is about thinking outside boxes. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely agree with, with, with what Terry said. From, from, from Queen Margaret's point of view, we, we don't have an entrepreneurial module that everybody does, but we have the concepts embedded in particular programs. Uh, we now encourage business startups on the part of our students. We have about um, half a dozen this year. And surprisingly enough, you would expect them to be in healthcare. Well, they're not. They're in drama and performance and Create, the creative industries and, and, and some fascinating areas. Okay. Thank you. you should come to the economy committee. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I suppose the, the, the same kind of is that the, um, the concept of uh, this whole, whole area doesn't necessarily always have to be about somebody setting up a new business. There will be great entrepreneurs within the public sector, with probably with, you know, within schools. Maybe even within in politics, it's about getting. It seems um, somewhat doubtful. Yeah, yeah, James, you know, surely, surely. I, I said maybe. Sorry, I'll think of one. It's about getting. It's about getting that inspirational person in front of a, of a of a young person, and I think if we can get make sure that business people are in front of uh, pupils, they'll they'll pick up the spark and they'll they'll get excited. Um, Street. I mean, yes, do that, but there has to be something. Does it not? Through, through the teaching mechanism of you know, finding the entrepreneurs or, or at least exposing them to the opportunities. Yeah, and, and I guess, though, that that's the, that's the role of the, the, the educator who's spending the time with pupils and, and seeing the ones who are, you know, are behave, behaving in a, you know, maybe a risk-taking way and, and encouraging those types of things rather than suppressing them. If I were to generalise, I would say that actually primary schools are much better at this than secondary schools. You get some fantastic examples of uh, businesses being set up in primary schools and uh, tied on to things like uh, the eco agenda or uh, the you know a whole range of, of different the rights respect in schools agenda. And often you'll see really vibrant uh, examples of, of entrepreneurship there, where perhaps we don't do so well in secondary. Thank you. Um, I think. George, do you have a quick yeah, supplementary? Uh, a quick one, just uh, to, on the back of what Chicks just said. Uh, I think it's, it's not so much just the entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial side of things as well. It's what Alan mentioned earlier on about uh, sports people, anything that can engage with, whether it be the parents, whether it be someone that's got the credibility with uh, the family to uh, make that leap into education. Is that not the case that you know we could maybe look at this a wee bit differently to try and use sport, uh, business people, all these people that, uh, that we want uh, young people to aspire to be like? Is it not a way that we can get them really involved in the educational process? There's a, a lovely, very brief anecdote. <clears throat> Our head of outreach was in a primary school uh, talking about the children's university and the opportunities that young people could get involved. Um, and afterwards, there's just sort of melee of the class, and he said the class parted, and the class hard man walked towards him. He said he'd, he'd got fists like 
sledgehammers, and he wouldn't look at him, and he just said, I don't suppose my boxing would count, would it? And the head of outreach said, well, let's go and talk to your boxing coach about it. So he went the next day, spoke to the boxing coach with the young lad, and found out that this young lad knew all about nutrition, all about a regime, all about discipline, all about timekeeping, all about a whole lot of things, but had never thought of it in, the, in, in, in terms of learning. Thank you. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Hey, thanks very much, uh, convener. I was going to go back to a, a theme picked up by, by Gordon earlier on in terms of, I suppose, the qualities of, of, of opportunity. I think Gordon was picking up on the, the issue in relation to particular areas, whether or not the engagement of employers is, is more problematic um, because of the kind of makeup of the, the local economy. I think, to give a couple of examples there. But it's been a, a theme, or perhaps a criticism of the Wood Report, if, uh, if such a thing exists. Um, a number of, of, of people have picked up on this point. If I can quote this Scottish Youth Parliament, who's just one of a number, there's a significant risk of marginalising young people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds in the practical delivery of the recommendations, which could have uh, no effect or an adverse effect on attainment. For example, the basic costs of sending a young person on good quality work experience may inhibit choice. And I think that was a point you were making earlier on, um, James, in, in, in suggesting that those family relationships or parental relationships may open up doors that aren't then um, uh, open to, to, to others in, in that cohort. Is there a role that schools have to play in, in triaging the, the opportunities? Because I think if, uh, I think it was perhaps you, Alan, who was saying that people are doing things because they, they see a, a, an interest in it as well as the, the more altruistic um, uh, motives. Uh, and therefore, it, they may be um, predisposed to identify the, the higher performing pupils and get them in for work experience, when actually the opportunities and the, uh, uh, the, the, that uh, are available may, may be better for raising the attainment of, of others within that class group. I mean, how do we get around that, uh, that situation where, in a sense, the, the, the more able pupils are gravitating to the better work experience opportunities? I mean, I think picking up on what Kevin said earlier, I think there's much greater reflection on the part of teachers. There's much less preciousness. There's much less we can fix everything. And certainly from our own experience of, of our work, not only through the Children's University, but through the academies, there was an openness on the part of teachers and a desire to get involved and work in partnership. And I'm not sure whether five, ten years ago, that, that that willingness to work in partnership, that triaging that you that you referred to, I, I don't think that was there. So I think there's a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. But that's some, that's a that's a judgment that will be reached at by the, the schools and the employers in discussion rather than employers saying, look, this is this is what we have to offer, this is this is what we need in return. And that the actual the, the schools are, are, are brokering that in a way that, that better reflects the interests of the, the individual People, I think that's it. It needs a lot of in-depth knowledge about the needs and the abilities of the young people. So you've got the insights from the school, working with partners, careers, you know, advice, uh, employers and the partners. So it, it, it comes right down to knowledge about what would benefit that young person. Mm. I think there's another dimension to this, which is that we should use our collective work with employers to benefit all sectors, um, because the colleges as a sector, have very, very strong employer engagement. So I think the city of Glasgow had mentioned they had 1,500 employers they worked with in their submission. Um, in West Lothian's case, we worked with around about 800 employers. So you know, in terms of our partnership with the school, that's got to be something we could make more benefit from in terms of not keeping our employers to ourselves, but making sure actually that they're involved with that whole skills pipeline development. So young people from school um, coming on placements and then also working with the college. And for employers, I think that makes a much more joined up approach to the skills development of young people. And there's some great examples of some leading employers who are heavily investing, you know, Mitsubishi, Shinetsu, um, really investing and in looking at those placements and opportunities right through from school, college and on into employment. So it's not about employers for schools, employers for colleges. It's about employers that we all work to better effect. Sorry, Liam. Sorry, 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 check. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, if, I could, if I could f f perhaps flip that round in that um, pr presumably there are challenges in, in areas where uh, of higher deprivation in terms of the, the, the kind of ecology of, of, of 
of, of businesses that may be um, able to engage. But similarly, you'll, you'll be aware of, of some concerns around the way in which the attainment fund is, is targeted at the SMI, SIMD um, 20 uh, group of areas, that, that actually what it doesn't do is pick up the, the areas of poverty and, and, and the attainment issues perhaps in, in those areas which generally are, are perhaps slightly more affluent. Um, but, but where I think um, pretty much in all parts of the country there are pockets of poverty and individuals who perhaps need that support. Is that something that um, you see as, as, as a potential problem? Uh, and if so, are there things that we can do to perhaps link the funding to the individual rather than necessarily to the, to the neighbourhood or the area? Careful what I'm saying here, because as director of Western Battenshire, I'm delighted that we are involved in the, the Scottish Attainment Challenge. But I'm here representing ADES, and ADES did have some questions about the, the, the distribution method for this, in the sense that you have, if I give you an example, uh, we're involved in the Schools Improvement Partnership Programme uh, with Renfrewshire. And um, so it's our, the, school, the primary schools in our most deprived areas paired with the primary schools. Uh, in the most deprived areas in Renfrewshire. Now, Renfrewshire is not involved in the attainment challenge, but in fact, the most deprived of the Renfrewshire schools are more deprived than the most deprived in Western Bartonshire. So there are anomalies here, and, and I suppose statistically, the way to really address the most the, the youngsters living in the most deprived area would be get down to, to get down to primary school level across the country. Uh, Areas like Fife, for instance, which have areas of significant affluence, but also have areas of, of, of real poverty. Uh, so they, they also don't come into this. So ADES has raised some questions about the, uh, the distribution uh, method, um, but I, I think that it could provide us with a very interesting uh, piece of work going forward over the next four years to look at what we can really do uh, to address some of the uh, attainment gap issues. Yeah, that's I just briefly ask following on from Mary's question about the engagement of the colleges with the employers and the 800, was it 800 employers and what are Skills Development Scotland doing? We, we work uh, actually in West Lothian. We have a very positive partnership with, with Skills Development Scotland and they are focused. They actually help to support some of our programmes with employers. Um, and they certainly work with us in terms of the modern apprenticeship places. So as a college, we have a number of modern apprentices, apprentices with um, Skills Development Scotland and um, some young students going through employability programmes. Um, so I can speak about our experience uh, locally, which is actually very positive. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Siobhan. Thank you. Um, we've touched on this, but I wanted to get to the bigger picture and, and how this implementation plan fits in with everything else. I mean, already this session, this committee has looked at the early years task force, curriculum for excellence, teaching Scotland's future, structural reform in colleges, the focus on youth employment, through opportunities for all and other initiatives, legislative reform and FE and HE, governance, etc. So, nice easy question for you. What do you consider will be the light reduction in youth unemployment based on this plan? Anybody want to put a number on it? <laughs> <laughs> James. Um, I think in, our, uh, in the regional investing youth group, we've put a number on uh, youth unemployment. Um, we, we are generally looking at positive destinations, and, and um, so that may include university or, or um, vocational qualifications, as, as people um, have used the term. Uh, there are, uh, there's not such a significant number um, in the northeast. I think, from memory, there's something in the region of 600 pe young people at the moment uh, without a positive destination. It, it would feel to me as though we could almost grab them and, and, and work with them on an individual basis. Um, but I, th I think one of the things um, that, uh, that Liam had alluded to earlier, some of these uh, young people have quite a different distance to travel um, the, than others. And uh, I think, you know, when we come back to careers advice, work experience, it's about trying, trying to work with, uh, with educators who are spending a lot more time with these young people to, um, to work out how long and, and what process we need to go through with an employer to get them to, um, to, to that positive place. Um, so, in a roundabout way of not answering your question at all, um, 
you know, I, I, I think uh, you know we, we've got a relatively small number in our area, and, and in some respects, with with uh, everything that's going on, if we could maintain that, it would be a fantastic result. But we do see that as not being good enough, and, and we're pretty committed to uh, to actually lowering that below the 600. But can I just Terry, follow up? Just what what Terry wants to go in, sir. Um, I mean, I think that's a fascinating question, and you, you, the, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to put a figure on it either. So I'm not going to answer answer your question. However. Um, I do think it's interesting. One of the reasons that I'm so enthusiastic about this whole agenda is that I think it has the potential to change Scottish society for the better. That sounds quite grandiose, but I genuinely do believe that that's the case. If, this, if you look at the success criteria that is laid out in the final report, if we succeed, Scottish society will have been changed for the better. However, in terms of employment uh, prospects for young people, this is something that education cannot deliver on its own. And one of the things that's always struck me is that one of the entitlements in Curriculum for Excellence is support for a young person into a sustained positive destination. Now, we can give all the support that we can, but if the sustained positive destinations are not there to support them into, then that's where the issue lies. So the ultimate delivery of this uh, will succeed if we play our part but if economic growth uh, at a societal level, at a macroeconomic level, uh, is delivered across Scotland, because unless the two marry up, then we can have the best prepared workforce uh, on the planet, but without the sustained positive destinations for them to go to. So I think there's a larger societal challenge here, which I think is, is behind your question. But I suppose, given your answers... I know that there isn't a coherent education policy, and we talked about the, the pockets of good practice in earlier evidence this morning. How do we make this implementation plan work? And should it take importance over the rest of the pathways or plans that are already um, established or, or looking to be established? I think that is a challenge. I think it has to articulate rather than be a bolt on mm. or disrupt what's already in place and what's happening and at the same time I think it is about taking something that's a, a grand strategy and thinking how do we translate it to a local level because I think it will work if it's locally appropriate and the partnership working as we were talking about earlier on so I was thinking very carefully about how do we take something like this and translate it uh, so that it, it it allows creativity and it allows some of the examples we've heard about the flexibility and so on and allows that to develop. But I think those involved at key decision levels, whether it's school, people working on uh, local authority, employers, I think they have to feel supported to take those decisions as well. That if they want to be flexible, if they want to take risks and work in new ways, I think that culture has to run alongside, alongside this initiative. Okay. Um, I think very much the Developing Scotland's Young Workforce builds on initiatives that are already well underway. So we've been very clear that this builds on Curriculum for Excellence. It's not something different. It's not something, you know, um, dissimilar from that. It builds on what is already there. However, that said, I think it needs to be driven forward relentlessly. And, you know, in terms of delivering on those recommendations from Wood, there's commitment to at least, you know, the fact this is a seven-year programme because... What it needs not to be is a short-term initiative or something that might be changing our minds about in two years' time. This, seriously, as Terry said, is, I think, the most significant time of change for young people's opportunities. And so we're committing for the long term here, and quite rightly. And I think that needs to be driven forward, actually, quite, quite relentlessly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liam, quick supplementary. Yeah, I, it was something, I think, um, Terry, you were, you were saying there about the, the sustained positive destinations. I mean, obviously what we want to do is, is get this as right as we possibly can, as early as we can, and, and that actually in terms of lifetime attainment, that's, that, that's the, the best guarantee, even if it offers no absolute guarantee. But throughout the whole debate about youth employment, there's been the nagging feeling, particularly with the college sector, that we're dealing with a sector um, uh, which uh, enshrines the concept of lifelong learning. 
And businesses won't go belly up um, um, on a whim. Um, with the best will in the world, they will, they will come and go. And those sustainable opportunities will only arise if we have a commitment to lifelong learning. And a lot of people we're, we're talking about here will come in and out of that learning process. Is, is, there, a, is there a need for us to, 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 to sort of continually reinforce um, that notion that this it doesn't provide a guarantee, this doesn't mean that you won't come back and do it other learning at, at other stages and, and get that reinforced at the earliest point as well as just the notion that the here and now is important for these life skills that will set you on a, on a reasonable pathway. Uh, yes, I think. <laughs> the, uh, I, I mean, going back to a point that James was making earlier, uh, that a lot of the, the, the employability skills training are generic skills and, and, and transferable skills. And I think that that's going to be really important because, I mean, it's become a truism in education that we're educating young people for jobs that haven't been invented yet. Mm -hmm. Um, so skills have to be transferable, but the fact that, 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 that technology will continue to develop means that people are going to have to engage in, in, uh, in lifelong learning if they're going to adapt to the, the, the changing society and the demands that different, uh, that, that, uh, that different jobs and different employment uh, patterns will make on them. But uh, absolutely, I think that that's what we have to be involved in. It may be more a reflection of a... a, a a sort of political weakness that while you're focusing on, on one thing as a priority, the, the, the danger is that you, you stop focusing as a priority on, on other areas. And therefore, I think it, it, it's helpful if there's a message back that that element of lifelong, if we, even if we get this right, that doesn't diminish the importance yeah. of lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and Mary, so James. Um, on, on lifelong learning uh, in the workplace, um, our, our research suggests that 98% of employers think that training and, and investment in training is a good thing. So I'd suggest that the 2% of businesses who don't think that will be the ones that will go. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so I, I think all that um, the, the, the education sector can do is get people to the place where they're, they're in, they're in that, that, that pathway. Once they're in a job, it's over to the employers to to be enlightened and invest in their own staff and see the benefits that that, that returns. And I think, on the whole, we're, uh, we're moving in a pretty good direction in that place. Um, and I guess the only challenge is when we you know, have economic down cycles that um, businesses think, well, actually, we'll keep investing in our staff because when we come out of it, we'll be in a better pay place to push on. And that's probably something that we, we need to work on. Mary. Um, echo Terry's comments um, to yourself, Liam, and say yes, absolutely. Uh, lifelong learning at the, at the heart of that, and we need not to forget all the parallel activity. And there have been some, um, and over the last few years in particular, with, with the recession, there have been some very large-scale responses to redundancies right across Scotland, in which colleges have played a, played a very significant role, along with other partners. So I think none of that is ever to be forgotten. Um, and certainly, if you did a straw poll around this room. To put your hand up if you're doing now what you thought you were going to be doing at 17. I imagine that would be quite disparate around this room alone. Um, so absolutely um, central to the central to the relearning of others. Okay, thank you. This, this had better be small, Mary. Very <laughs> small, and it's only to one person. And I'll tell you what it is. Um, over the past 10 years, the percentage improvement in attainment is in my favourite publication. And East Dumbartonshire improved attainment in the last 10 years by 15%, which is commendable. But I just wonder if uh, Terry could tell us why West Dumbartonshire only improved by 2%. Uh, well, first of all, it depends which measure you take, uh, and I can give you another figure, which, uh, yes, I know, but that's, uh, uh, with respect, that that is a selective document, um, and there is another figure which, which indicates that we have uh, improved by 10 per cent in uh, youngsters getting three-plus hires at the end of S6 in the last four years. I would also say that in Western Bartonshire, if you look at the latest benchmarking data, which was published in December, um, the proportion of youngsters from... Uh, SIMD deciles one and two, gaining five plus higher equivalents by the end of S6. For that statistic, we are the third top in Scotland, and only Eastern Bartonshire and East Renfrewshire are above us. 
which I think is quite a remarkable achievement, given that the numbers of youngsters in SIMD, deciles one and two, in those two authorities are very, very small, and the levels of deprivation in Western Bartonshire are very high. So we can bandy statistics around, but I think I can show that there is significant and sustained improvement in a range of measures, uh, not necessarily the ones that uh, Audit Scotland chose to focus on. OK, I think I'll say 15 all. At that stage, and can I ask <laughs> just <laughs> one final question, um, um, which is obviously the government has said it will publish an annual progress report on the work um, of implementing the Developing Scotland's uh, Young Workforce Programme. And I just wondered if you had any suggestions, advice or comments you wanted to make about what should be in that report. James. Um, well, uh, I suppose we're slightly... Um, ahead of the game in this and that we do have a regional invest in youth group so at the end of uh, year one which is only two months long for us uh, we will have a board in place um, we'll have um, have had a series of working group meetings for work experience careers communications um, and uh, and so progress is, is is moving i think then um, as we look towards the, the end of the first operational year, once the executive team in place, we'd like to see that all, every single secondary school has a, a business partner, a formal business relationship. I think that type of measure starts to show that there's commitment from both sides to, uh, to actually make a difference in this area. And if we don't achieve that, um, I'll be extremely disappointed. Thank you. Terry? Uh, I think uh, both Vary and I are on the National Programme Board for Developing the Young Workforce. And um, I, I believe that uh, over the last few months we have developed a programme or a series of programmes that should provide evidence for the annual report. Uh, we've got the five different work streams, which are all been, uh, have all got very clear uh, milestones and, and, and targets. So I think that that will be part of it. I think the work of the groups that, that uh, James has referred to will also uh, be uh, important. Um, so I would think that in the first year, it may be more of a, a narrative rather than a statistical report because I think it will take longer for the hard stats to, to really come through. But a narrative about where we have got to in terms of particularly the five separate work streams. Uh, so that will cover employment and engagement. It will, co it will cover uh, what we are doing in the broad general education and the senior phase. There will be s some statistical evidence on modern apprentices, I would think. And uh, the, some evidence from, the, from what the colleges are doing. So I think that that should form the basis of it, um, off the top of my head. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Uh, Alan, do you have any yeah, comments? Yeah, no, I, I, I would support that. And we've talked quite a lot about, um, well, we started the conversation about measuring attainment. I would agree with Terry. There may be more of a narrative. And I would like to see uh, information about partnerships, about collaboration. Um, about what, what's been built upon, about some of the consistency that we've talked about um, uh, this morning. But we've also talked quite a lot about cultural shift, and I'm not going to start opening up that debate as to how you measure that, but I would like some progress to be made in, in, in actually trying to identify how much of a cultural shift has been made. Thank you. Kevin? Coming from a research perspective, I it's interesting to hear what we've just heard there, and I'd endorse those. And I'd, I also would expect to see a narrative, really, given the ambitious scale of this, you'd expect to see evidence of infrastructure being put in place, systems being put in place that will lead on to the, the maybe the more metric, the more quantitative indicators over time. OK, thank you. And finally, Mark. Yeah, I would, li I would like an annual report to pull out and highlight the real value being added by high quality partnership working across the five um, change teams because we've said on the programme board none of this will be successful in isolation so it really has to be how are we pulling right across all the change teams um, for success. Thank you very much. Can I thank all of you for uh, coming along this morning and giving your time. That was um, almost two hours and I think so we gave it a, a fair a fair old go at that this morning, but it was very important we, we started setting in, in to cover some of the broad themes as well as some of the detail as we go forward on looking at uh, uh, the attainment gap. Um, so thank you very much for your attendance today and can I suspend the meeting briefly?
Okay, our final item today is uh, Petition PE1530 um, on the 27th of January 2015. The Public Petitions Committee referred Petition PE1530 by Spencer Files on behalf of the Scottish Secular Society to this committee. The petition calls for the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to issue official guidance to bar the presentation in Scottish publicly funded schools of separate creation and of young earth doctrines as viable alternatives to the established science of evolution, common descent and deep time. Uh, members have the clerk's note, which provides links to the petition and the previous consideration by the Petitions Committee. Um, can I ask members if they've got any comments or any uh, points they want to raise at this stage or any action? Uh, any further action that uh, the committee may or may not wish to take in relation to this petition? Sorry, Mary. <coughs> it was only a, a point of clarification, <coughs> really, that I would be interested, convener, sorry, <coughs> I would be interested in uh, seeing some information about why other UK administrations um, issued guidance that creationism and intelligent design should not be considered um, I would just find that interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, Liam. Thanks, Savina. Just um, in relation to the paper that's prepared for the Petitions Committee in paragraph 14, it refers to the um, evidence from EIS and the Scottish Leaders uh, Scotland. Um, it suggests that neither believe that the guidance is necessary um, and, and justify that by saying that teaching of creationism is, is neither prevalent nor a serious problem in Scottish schools, um, which I'm sure was meant as a, a reassurance, but the use of the word prevalence and, and um, serious problem as opposed to problem, um, I think raised questions with me about the extent of, of, of cases where this has um, arisen. I mean, I don't think I would necessarily support um, uh, intervention by way of guidance because it, it tends to go against the grain of the way ministers um, uh, do and should uh, interact with uh, work in, in schools. So I'd have to observe that um, where it says EIS, quotes EIS saying the curriculum is a matter for teachers both individually and collectively and that legislative interference in the content of the curriculum is both undesirable and unnecessary. I would agree with that, um, but I would observe that um, in the recent past there has been controversy around um, uh, items being placed on the uh, recommended reading list for Scottish studies, which do, does seem to kind of move away slightly from um, that overarching principle, but I, I think it would be helpful to get the clarification that Mary's um, indicated. Um, but, but I think uh, I'd be reluctant to have ministers issuing guidance here, uh, simply because we'll be we'll be in a situation where there'll be other areas where similar guidance is probably there. Yeah. Okay. So, Chick, did you want to? Speak? Yeah. I, I was. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I was on the petitions committee when this uh, this first raised its head. Um, well, I'm. You know, I'll go along with the committee. I'm, I'm minded to uh, send both the secular society and those that support creationism away with a message that I think it was Einstein who said, everyone who is seriously interested in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that spirit is manifest in the laws of the universe, a spirit vastly superior to man and one in the face of which our modest powers must feel humble. I think they should go away in a room and discuss that and just let everybody else go on with your, the, the curriculum, the way it is. Uh, okay, thank you for that. Any other contributions at this stage? Um, um, I think, I, I, in my own view, is I mean, I, I'm quite happy to take on both the suggestions. Um, I'm sure the committee is of both uh, Mary and Liam in terms of finding out a bit more information. Um, I, I think I certainly would accept what Liam said about the nature, if you like, of Scottish education and uh, the fact that the issues or guidance are not, directors are not issued in this sense in the same way they may be elsewhere. And that may be the difference that uh, Mary was uh, asking about. And the, the government, I think, has, the Scottish government has made quite clear that they don't issue guidance in this sense. So I would certainly accept that. Um, the one thing I would uh, mention to the committee is, obviously in advance of this uh, petition coming to the committee, I've been forwarded by a member of the public a letter they have received um, from their MSP, um, which obviously was written on their behalf to the Minister. The Minister wrote to Aileen Campbell MSP, um, and it, it contains, I think, what is actually quite a useful um, paragraph in the letter, and I think um, I want to, to just make members aware of it. It says, in relation to school science teaching, guidance is provided by Education Scotland in line with Curriculum for Excellence. The guidance does not identify creationism as a scientific principle 
and consequently it is not and should not be part of science learning and teaching. Likewise, Education Scotland does not identify creationism as a scientific theory or a topic for inclusion within the curriculum. Therefore, creationism should not be taught within science lessons. Now, I think that's quite a clear statement there um, by uh, the Minister Alistair Allen on the issue. But given, um, given the questions that have been raised, uh, I think maybe it's appropriate, and I'll ask the committee what their views are, that we, we write to the government, uh, ask them about the difference between uh, what's happening elsewhere in the UK, the Mary's question about what's happening across the UK. Um, just for clarity on that, although I think it is to do with the different traditions in the, in the education system, uh, and also asking them to uh, just confirm their position as laid out in the letter, I think, uh, quite fairly by Alistair Allen on the 26th of February. Liam. I'm, I'm entirely supportive of that. I mean, it would be helpful perhaps to, to inquire whether or not um, they have a sense as to how prevalent or not, or how serious a problem or not this is. I mean, in a sense, it will be up to local authorities to take action where those so. concerns are, are raised. But obviously, there's been um, one very prominent ex example where um, concerns have been raised. Um, but I think th there, there are others, and, and getting a sense as to uh, how widespread uh, th those uh, issues are, how frequently they've arisen in the past, would, would also be helpful. Well, uh, is the committee agreed then, if there are any other points, is the committee agreed to write? Sorry, Mary. Yeah. If, if I may, can I just ask if the letter that you read out, which, which is uh, fine, but you've said the Scottish Government don't offer guidance, uh, but that seemed pretty clear this guidance was, this, to me. This was from Education Scotland. They from Education to... Scotland. Uh -huh. yeah. is, is that letter to this committee, or no, will sorry, that letter no, no. Will was... that go out to all local authorities? No, no, this was obviously a letter to, well, Eileen Campbell was the MSP yeah. from the Minister. Okay. I presume she was, uh, she was raising a question on behalf of a constituent with okay. the Minister. He got, she got this response, which she so, passed to the constituent, who then e sent it to me. Okay, so that would have been a few years ago then that she got that letter. No, this is the 26th of February 2015. Okay, all right, it was on behalf of the constituent. Uh -huh. I, I, I just wonder, given that the, the letter is absolutely clear and, and uh, I'm fine with that, will that letter be available to all local authorities? Or because it no. is quite clear in what it's saying. Well, and I think that's no. This is a letter. Um, obviously, Just from the minister MSP. to an individual uh, yeah. who's, who's acting, uh, an individual MSP who's acting on behalf of a constituent. Okay. Um, but I think it states it's, the government's position I quite clearly. I think it's quite, quite clear. Yeah. But I think, for clarity, if we ask as a committee, then that letter would come back to the committee, and then position would be, I think, available for everybody to see, rather helpful. than use an individual yeah. letter about a constituent. That would be very helpful. And I think yeah. that's why I'm suggesting that we write to the government and. and uh, about the three points. One is about the clarity of the position, with, yep. as referred to the 26th of February yep. letter, to an individual member of the public. Yep. Um, secondly, was the question you raised about the difference in, I think, yep. cultures, to be honest, in terms of the uh, information and, and guidance elsewhere in the US, UK. And the third was the uh, issue raised by uh, Liam about prevalence, prevalence uh, yeah. or otherwise. That's fine. Are members content? Yep. Okay, that's agreed. We'll take that uh, course of action. And uh, with that, that's the end of the, uh, today's agenda. Thank you very much for your attendance and cooperation, and I close the meeting.